Razer is a new web framework which has different hosting modules, including client side and the server side. In the client side hosting model, Blazor is designed to run in the browser on a WebAssembly based .NET runtime. In the server side hosting model, Blazor is designed to run in ASP.NET Core. In general, the client side hosting type is called Blazor WebAssembly and the server side one is called Blazor Server. Using .NET 4, client side web development offers the following advantages. Create rich interactive UIs with C Sharp and Razor instead of JavaScript. Share server side and client side app logic written in .NET. Render UI as HTML and CSS for wide browser support, including mobile browsers. Call into JavaScript libraries and browser APIs as needed. Integrate with modern hosting platforms such as Docker. From now on, I want to talk the most interesting hosting model, the Blazor WebAssembly. The Blazor WebAssembly is a rich web UI experience using HTML, CSS, and C Sharp instead of JavaScript. This primary hosting model is running on the WebAssembly. Blazor apps, dependencies, and .NET runtime are downloaded to the browser. The app is executed directly on the browser's UI thread. UI updates and event handling occur within the same UI thread. Assets are deployed to server as static files. Therefore, we can say that the Blazor WebAssembly is a true single-page application with full interactivity. Utilize client-side resources. Support offline static sites. In summary, this model offers a direct competitor to JavaScript based single page applications such as Angular, React, and Vue.js. In general, as we described it earlier, Blazor WebAssembly based applications run in the browser on WebAssembly. On top of the WebAssembly, build a .NET runtime. Then, build a Razor component that could compile into normal .NET assemblies. They are downloaded with the runtime in the browser and executed directly in the browser. Finally, browser sends UI events to the .NET codes, then the difference sent to the DOM and updated efficiently. This is the whole process of the Blazor WebAssembly based client side applications. First, I will create a Blazor WebAssembly app, then explain the project structure. Let's create a Blazor WebAssembly app with the default settings. Create a new project. I am going to create Blazor WebAssembly app. Select this. With this selection, go next. With this settings, go next. Click the create button. The project has been created successfully. This is the project name we just entered and there are several folders and the files. First, we have connected services item. This is being used to discover WCF services. And this is also being used to configure WCF configuration. The second item in the solution explorer is properties folder. Inside the properties folder, we have only one file, namely launch settings JSON file. Actually, this is a setting file for local development machine only. This is not for staging or this is not for production environment. Let's see the content. There are three objects inside this file. The first one is IIS settings. The second one is profiles. The third one is Blazor WebAssembly app one. Actually, this name is same with the project name. Now, let's see in detail. We have application URL in the first object and we have SSL port here. In the second object, 
we have some settings actually we use these settings when we press ctrl plus f5 asset type the application we will use these settings if we use dotnet command to launch this application these settings will be used however most of the elements inside this file are common for asp.net core applications but there is one element special it is inspect uri we have it here and we also have it here actually this is only for blazer web assembly application let's see in detail we have some placeholder inside this element inspect uri property in the launch settings json file enables the ide to detect that the app is a blazer web assembly application second this property instructs the script debugging infrastructure to connect to the browser through blazer's debugging proxy and this is only for blazer web assembly applications debugging purpose we have some placeholder inside this element WS protocol, URL host name, URL port, and the browser inspect URI. The first one, WS protocol is WebSocket protocol. WebSocket protocols enables interaction between a web browser and a web server. The second one is URL host, we know that. And the third one is URL port. We just saw that inside the settings. And the last one is browser inspect URI. This is provided by the framework. For example, in the Blazor framework, this inspect URI provided by the framework. The third item in the solution explorer is web root folder. However, I will explain this folder later. Before this, I need to explain Pages folder. Pages folder contains the routable components or pages that make up the Blazor application. The folder contains following components. Counter component implements counter page. Data component implements fetch data page. The index component implements the home page. The route for each page is specified using the add page directive. Now, let's see one of the components in details in terms of the coders and the page structure. Let's see counter component. Razor code blocks start with add mark and include it by curly brace. First, we have add page directive this is responsible for routing then we have html and in the lower portion we have c sharp codes namely we have three blocks in this page the first is razor directive blocks namely all directives comes here of course, some directives come in other parts of the page, but most of the common directives come the first portion of the page. The second part is HTML code block. Here we write HTML codes. Then we have C sharp code block. Here we write C sharp codes, namely .NET code blocks. In summary, Blazor component page divided into three blocks. The first block is directive, second block is HTML, and the third block is C sharp code blocks. Now let's see generic Razor page structure. Generic Razor page structure is very simple. It has three parts. In other words, this is the Razor page, or this is the Razor component. Inside the Razor component, First, we have Razor Directives part. Second, we have HTML code block. Third, we have C sharp code block. This is so simple. Of course, we may place C sharp code in other files and then import in the directives block of the component page. 
it is a shop code parts is volume is big it is better to separate the razor and the shop code parts it gives clear page format the next item is shared folder shared folder contains following components and the style sheets main layout component the apps layout component this is a layout component for this whole application and this is very important and it has been inherited from layout component base class then we have corresponding css file namely style sheet for this main layout component the second component is no menu component and this implements the sidebar navigation for this application then we have corresponding no menu css file namely style sheet for this no menu component finally we have survey prompt component this is a survey component from microsoft layout component is very important in an application because many components or many pages will be rendered inside the layout component so therefore layout component is very important it has add body directive and many components many pages will be rendered in the location of the add body directive layout components based on blazer templates and they use razor extension blazer layout shares markup with components that reference it layout can use data binding dependency injection and other features of the component a layout can be placed in the same folder as the components use it. Layout components shared across an application's components and place it in the application's shared folder. Because many components will share the layout components. Therefore, in general, in default, we place it in the shared folder. Use at body to specify the location in the layout markup where the content is rendered. Namely, if we use this layout component in the application, related components will be rendered in the location of the at body directive. The next item is imports.razor file. This file includes common razor directives to include in the apps components such as add user directives for namespaces this is a global file and it can be seen everywhere from the application the next item is app.razor file namely the root component of the application that sets client-side routing using the router component the router component intercepts the browser navigation and renders the page that matches the requested address all components will be rendered inside the app component because you see here inside the app component we are calling main layout actually inside the main layout we are calling or we are rendering all related components so this means that all related components inside this application will be rendered inside the, this app component namely the root component from this assignment we know that we may use any customized layout component in the blazer apps if we have a layout other than the main layout we may use this instead of the main layout therefore from this assignment we know that we may use any customized layout component in the blazer applications this is very convenient and this is very powerful actually this root component is calling inside the index page for example we are calling app component inside the index page this index page is the sing single html page inside this single page application the app component is specified as the div dom element with an id of app just here div id loader then in program cs it is added to the builder's root component collection namely builder root components add app 
Therefore, there is one thing we need to understand. We have the Rube Component app. The Rube Component app is called two places. One is in the index HTML page just here, dev element of the DOM. Then we are calling the same app functionality inside the program. And then in the program CS, it is added to the builder's root component collection. The last item is the program CS file. Program CS file, the app's entry point that specifies the web assembly host. This file has two important roles. One, the app component is specified as the div DOM element with an ID of app to the root component collection. Yeah. Component collection and the app is added as an ID of app. The second rule is services are added and configured in this entry point of the application. We may add services here. For example, we are adding HTTP client service. Finally, no root folder, namely www root folder. This is the public folder of this application. Inside this folder, we have style sheets, JavaScript, image files, and app settings. For example, app settings development, app settings staging, app settings production, and then we have index page. Actually, this index page located in the web root folder, index HTML. Therefore, this is the public folder of this application. The first three is directives and subdirectives. We have style sheets, JavaScript files, and image files. The index HTML web page is the root page of the application implemented as an HTML page. When any page of the app is initially requested, this page is rendered and returned in the response. In this application, we have only one HTML page, that is index page. Therefore, when any page of the app is initially requested, this page is rendered and returned in the response. Namely, the page specifies where the root app component is rendered. Then, the component is rendered at the location of the div DOM element with an ID of app, namely div ID app loader. This DOM element is inside the index page. This is index page and this is the column location of the main root app component. First, I will introduce ASP.NET Core Razor components, then create an example component and call it from the side navigation of this application. Now, let's start it. This was the Blazor WebAssembly application last time I have created. There are folders and files in this project. In general, components are resided in the pages folder. In default, we have counter component, fetch data component, and index component in this application. Now, by using the counter component, I will introduce components in detail in the following section. Now, let's see components in detail. Blazor apps are built using Razor components. Let's say this is a Blazor app. This app consists of Razor Component 1, Razor Component 2, and Razor Component N. In Blazor applications, Razor Components has its own processing logic and its own dynamic behavior. Meaning, Component is a self-contained portion of user interface with processing logic to enable dynamic behavior. In the Blazor applications, some Razor components are simple. However, some Razor components are container components. In the case of container components, 
a container component includes multiple razor components. For example, in this case, component 2 includes razor component A and razor component B. Therefore, we can say that razor component A and the razor component B are nested components. These two components are nested inside component 2, namely nested inside the container component 2. If we have a razor component B, we can use it in MVC applications. We can also use it in other razor pages applications. This means that we can reuse, we can share razor components. In other words, components can be nested, reused, it, shared among projectors, and use it in MVC and the Razor Pages applications. Therefore, it is very important that when we designing Razor components, it should have its own processing logic and it should have its own dynamic behavior. Then we can reuse it, then we can share among projectors. This is the counter component in the application. Here we have directives and we have directive attributes. For example, add page is a directive, add code is a directive, and add current code is a directive attribute. Components use Razor syntax. Therefore, Razor syntax is very important in order to understand Blazor components. Now, let's see Razor syntax. Let's say this is a Blazor component or Blazor page. In the upper portion, we have Razor directives. Then we have HTML code block. HTML code block uses directive attributes. Finally, we have c -sharp code block. Classes, properties, and variables are referenced in HTML code block as the directive attributes, namely data binding. Blazor components use Razor syntax. Two Razor features are extensively used by components. One is directives. The second one is directive attributes. First, let's see directives. Change the way component markup is passed or functions. For example, the add page directive specifies a routable component with a route template and it can be reached directly by a user's request in the browser at a specific URL. Meaning, Add page directive is responsible for routing in the component. The second one is directive attributes. Directive attributes change the way a component element is passed or functions. For example, the add bind directive attribute for an input element binds data to the element's value. For example, in the counter component, we have a current count variable in the C -sharp code. In the meantime, we have a add current code directive attribute in the HTML code block. The add current code directive attribute is responsible for data binding between the HTML code block and the C -sharp code block because it is a variable in the C -sharp code block and it is a directive attribute in the HTML code block. In the Blazor components, there are many directives and directive attributes. We will introduce them one by one. Until now, we have explained directives and the directive attributes. Now, let's see how we can use directives and the directive attributes inside the Blazor components. This is the counter Blazor component. Inside this component, we are using add page directive. Then we are also using road template. This portion is called road template. Then we have directive attribute here. Current count is a directive attribute. Actually, this directive attribute is a variable inside the C -sharp code block. However, the same thing is a directive attribute inside the HTML code block. Directive attribute is a bind attribute. Data binding in components is accomplished with the at bind attribute. Directive attribute only applies to Razor components. The add code block enables the Razor component to add c -sharp members, for example, fields, properties, and the members to a component. Therefore, directive attributes is responsible for data binding between HTML code block and the corresponding c -sharp code blocks. In c -sharp code block, 
component state is specified and processed with c -sharp properties and the field initialized. Parameter values from arguments passed by the parent components and the road parameters. Namely, in the component, we have road parameters. In the c code block, we also have methods for user event handling, lifecycle events, and the custom component logic. For example, we have a start date parameter in the c -sharp code block. Component parameters should be declared as auto property, meaning that they shouldn't contain custom logic in their get or set accessor. In other words, we need to keep component parameters simple. Only they have get and set. We don't need to add logic inside the get or set accessor. However, we can initialize parameter inside the c -sharp code block. In this case, we are initializing the start date parameter with the date time now. Namely, writing an initial value to a component parameter is supported because initial value assignment don't interfere with the Blazor's automatic component rendering. So we can initialize a parameter inside the C-sharp code block. However, we have a warning here. Providing initial values for component parameters is supported, but don't create a component that writes to its own parameters after the component is rendered for the first time. This is important. Let's see this component in detail. In the road parameter portion, we have a parameter here. We call it rotor parameter. In other words, this is the query string in other frameworks. And we have a corresponding property inside the C code. For example, the text. This text is the corresponding parameter of the this road parameter. Components can be specified road parameters in the road template of the add page directive. For example, here. The Blazor router uses road parameters to populate corresponding component parameters. For example, this. We are populating this text parameter by using the text in the road parameter. Optional road parameters are supported. Actually, this text is optional parameter because we have question mark here. In fact, there are several methods we should not call them inside the Blazor components. For example, result, wait, wait any, wait all, sleep, and get result. These messages should not be coded inside the Blazor components. The preceding messages block the execution thread and thus block the app from resuming work until the underlying task is completed. This is very important. Finally, attributes can be applied to components with the attribute directive. The following example applies the authorized attribute to the components class. For example, we have add attribute directive and then we can use authorize here. If we add this attribute to the component, that component can be protected, then only authenticated user can access that component. In the following section, we will create a component, then we call it from the side the navigation of the application. Now, let's create a department component. Then I am going to display some data from Adventure Workers 2014 database. Namely, I am going to display the content of the department table. For this, I am going to create a static data source, namely a JSON data source. I will create inside the web root folder. Inside the sample data, I am going to create a department entity JSON static data. Department data JSON. In order to save time, I have prepared the data. Therefore, I just copy it and paste it here. This is the data I have prepared. Copy it. Copy. Then paste it here. First, I will clear this. Now paste it. This is the data I am going to display in the department component. Here we have department ID, name, group name, and the modified date. 
save. Now let's create the component. I will create the component in the pages folder. Now I have created the department component. This is the router of the component. Then I am going to use HTTP client in order to get data from the static department data. Therefore, I need to inject HTTP client service. I have department data and it has department ID, name, modified date. So I need to create one model. Now I am going to initialize the component. This is the location of the data. Let's clear this. Now the C-sharp code part is OK. Now first we have department entity array. This is the array. And we get data from the static department data JSON by using the HTTP client. Actually, we have implemented, we have injected HTTP client in the, for example, here, we have HTTP client service. We can use this service here. So this is the service. By using this service, I am getting data from the JSON. This is the JSON static data source. Now, we need to display this data. In order to save time, I have prepared the display code, namely, I have prepared the HTML code. I just copy it, copy, then paste it here. Now let's see it. Something's wrong here. Actually, this is wrong. Group name. This should be group name. Now, it seems to be okay. We have department ID, name, group name, and a modified date. This is the table header portion. And then we have table rows here. Department ID. This is the column. Department this is name column, this is group name column, and this is modified date column. So we have department ID, then we have name, then we have group name, 
and then we have modified date now it seems to be okay now we need to call this component in the side navigation we have a navigation component here in the shared folder this is the navigation I am going to display the department component in the side navigation therefore I just copy it copy this then just change here this is the component name our component name is department and this is the component name this is the label Save. now we have done it first before run it we need to check again first we created static JSON data source this is the department data we have some objects here in the object we have department ID department name group name and the modified date so based on this we have created model namely we have created this model department entity inside department entity just same as the data source we have department id name group name and modified date we get the data from the data source by using the http client namely we have used http dot get from json async and this is array namely this code returns an array because we have multiple objects inside the static data source so this is an array okay now we have the array therefore we need to display it on the component in, in order to display this entity or in order to display this array we need to write some html code namely html table this is the html table if department entity is null we just show loading if it's not null at that time we will display it in the table this, this is the header portion and this is the actual data they are department id column name column group name column and the modified date column and finally we call it this component on the side navigation this is the side navigation and uh, we are calling it here department this is the department component and this is the label name therefore it should be displayed in the side navigation bar now let's run it it's running hopefully it will display take some time okay it displays on the side navigation bar let's click it okay that it works the data has been displayed we have department id name group name and the modified date columns in summary in this tutorial i have introduced the blazer components its directives and the directive attributes and create a department component and display some data on it this is a blazer web assembly application in the default settings there is no configuration file in the project namely there is no app settings json file inside the web root folder therefore first i am going to add configuration file to this blazer web assembly application then store some values store some config values inside app settings json file finally i am going to introduce how to read config values from the configuration files and use it across the application
However, there are two ways to read config values from the configuration files. One is direct message. We can directly read the config values from the configuration file by using iConfiguration interface. And we use it specific laser components. And there is another way. We read the config values inside the program file and add the config values to the configuration collections. Then we can use these config values across the application. Therefore, I am going to do three things. One is add configuration file to the application, read configuration value locally. Third one is read configuration value globally. Now let's see it. Before adding configuration file, I would like to give brief introduction to the Blazor Web Assembly configuration. Blazor WebAssembly loads configuration from the following app settings file by default. Let's say this is a Blazor application. In general, in default, app settings will reside inside the WebRoot folder. This is the WebRoot folder. Therefore, WebRoot folder slash app settings JSON. In fact, app settings JSON has three types, namely app settings dot environment dot JSON. Meaning we have app settings dot development dot JSON, app settings dot staging dot JSON, and app settings dot production dot JSON. However, when runtime, the application will automatically pick up the corresponding environment's config values. If staging config value in the app settings dot staging dot JSON will be used. In production, config values in the app settings dot production dot json will be used therefore config value names should be consistent across these three app settings files but values might be environment specific however there is one warning configuration in a blazer web assembly application is visible to users don't store app secrets credentials or any other sensitive data in the configuration of a Blazor WebAssembly application. This is very important. Now let's see how can we get config value from app settings configuration. This is the default method. Later I will introduce another method. Configuration in app settings files are loaded by default. This means that a configuration value which is stored in an app settings file loaded by the Blazor framework automatically. In order to get it, inject an iConfiguration instance into a component to access the configuration data. As described earlier, in Blazor WebAssembly apps, the location of the app settings is WebRoot folder. Now, let's add configuration file to the project then store a config value in it. Finally, let's read the stored config value and use it in a Blazor web component. Now I am going to add app settings JSON file to the root folder. This is the root folder. I am going to add JSON file. App settings. I also add app settings dot development dot json. Now I have added app settings dot json and app settings dot development json. I am going to store a config value inside this file. Actually, I am going to store JSON placeholder APIs base URL. There is one API. Its name is JSON placeholder. This is a test API and it has there some data. It has some data. We can use it. For example, I am going to use this to do's. Inside the to do's, and we have one array. Inside this array, there are many to do's. For example, inside this array, there are many values. Therefore, I am going to use this and going to display this data in the Blazor component. Therefore, I am going to store 
this API based URL inside app settings and read it inside the component. Copy this. Paste it here. I am going to store only the base part. Save it. I also save the same thing inside app settings JSON because now I am in the app settings dot development. I am going to save the same thing inside the app settings JSON. Just copy it, paste it here. Now save. Now I have app settings JSON and I have app settings dot development JSON. In the next step, I am going to create a component. In general, components reside inside the pages folder. Create Razor component. My to this one. Add. Now I have created the component. In the next step, I am going to display data by using this component. First, I am going to add router, then inject some services. Now we are going to read the config value from the configuration, namely from the app settings JSON file. Therefore, I need to import some services. This is then inject now we are ready to read config elements from the configuration files okay i am going to display the to the data therefore i need to create one model namely i am going to create to do object Now, in the to-do class, we have user ID, user ID, 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 title, title, and completed, completed. Save it. In the API, this object is array. Namely, in the placeholder API, the to-do is array. Inside the to-do array, there are many to-dos. Therefore, I need to declare one array. Now, I am going to get the data from the API. Namely, I am going to call that API inside this component. First, I need to initialize this component. We need to inject HTTP client as well. Now we need to call that base URL here. In the settings file, we have this is the config name. Therefore, we just put it here. Then we have to do's. To do's here. It's to do's. Therefore, now we have the to do arrays. In order to display it, I need to write some HTTP codes. Actually, in order to save time, I have prepared it and I just copy it, place it here. 
copy this paste it here now I need to explain this I have to do this array here if the to do array is none just show loading if not null, display the data in the HTML table. This is the header part. In the header part, we have user ID, ID, title, and completed. Just like this. User ID, ID, title, and completed. Then we have table rows here. This is the actual value. For example, I am going to display user ID, ID, title, and completed actually this completed is boolean value therefore i am going to convert it yes or no for that i just use ternary operator that's it save this clear this now i created the component then get the data from the api and uh, display it in in the HTML table the component has been done now in the next step I am going to add this component to the side navigation actually we have side navigation in this application the side navigation is inside the shared folder this is the side navigation I am going to add that component namely the my to do's one component to the side navigation therefore i just copy this copy and paste it just call the component just here table now everything is okay save it before run it i will summarize it first i have added app settings json inside the app settings json i create one config value that config value is json placeholder api base url this is the api base url then i created one component the component name is my to do's inside the component i created one to do object or to do class because we have object here the to do object this is the to do object inside the placeholder api therefore i created one to do object the object is same as the data user id id title and completed because that to do is array inside the api therefore i created the array to do array then I get the data, namely I get the to do's array from the placeholder API. This is the base URL, then I add it to this. In this step, now I have all the data because namely the C sharp portion provides me the data. Next step, I need to display this data, therefore I added one HTML table. That now I have completed this component. I have coded this component in the side navigation of this application. Now I am going to run this application. Hopefully it will display the data. Let's try it. Run this. It's loading. Okay. It loaded. Now let's try. Now let's click this my to do's. Okay. It works namely the data has been displayed at present i just use the json placeholder api's base url then plus to this in the upcoming video i will introduce component parameter at that time we will use component parameter instead of this to do component parameters value will come from the outside of the component namely it will come via the template parameter now i am going to introduce another method to get config values from the configuration file namely i am going to get config values inside the program files
first I need to change some changes at here then put it here that's it this is the same as the original and we just changed its shape now we have http added here added scoped and then by using the http get the app settings content we read get as async and this is the response inside response we have this content then get the content of the response and read it as stream then this is the stream and this stream added to the add json stream now inside the configuration we have the content of the app settings json file that's it now actually let's see this class now this is the builder this builder has root components here and this builder also has services here this is the service collection and this is the root component collection actually if we see here we also have configuration here therefore we can add configuration now it's okay now in the configuration collection we have the content of the app settings json file now we can use it across the application save this I have introduced how to add configuration file to the default Blazor WebAssembly application. In this tutorial, I will create an English dictionary page by using two-way data bindings in Blazor WebAssembly application. This is the final dictionary page when it will be completed. It has a text box to enter the word to be searched and it also has a search button on it. The search result will be displayed in an HTML table with meanings and the corresponding examples columns. For example, if I search for test, this is the search result and it has meanings column and the corresponding examples column. Now let's start the coding and create this English dictionary page by using the two-way data bindings in Blazor WebAssembly application. Before start the coding, I would like to show the free dictionary API in GitHub. I am going to use this free dictionary API and I'm going to create one Blazor WebAssembly component. Inside the component, I am going to call this API for specific word and get the definition for that word. And this is the get and start and let's see here. Okay, now this is the base URL, then it has version option and then it has language code as well finally the word to be searched for a word for, for example for hello this is the full api url and this is the result for hello let's see the result the result is an array inside this array there is one json object inside this json object there is several arrays the first one is phonetics array and the second one is meaning array the meanings is an array inside the meaning array it has part of speech property and the definition is object list and the definition is array inside this definitions array there is definition and the corresponding example therefore inside the meaning array 
This is the first meaning, second meaning, and third meaning. This is all for hello. Later, I will create a corresponding C sharp object for this response array. Now, copy this. Go to the object. First, I need to create app settings configuration file inside the web root folder. App settings add. Now I need to create config element, namely. I just paste it here. Since I am going to store the base URL, I need to delete this hello. Okay, I have created the app settings configuration file now. And I have free dictionary API base URL here. Now I am going to create the component. In general, components resides inside the pages folder. My dictionary component add. In this component, I am going to access external API. Therefore, I need to inject some services. I need to inject I configuration service and I also need to inject HTTP client service. Now I am ready to write C sharp code. As I explained it here, this is the response object, and I will create corresponding C sharp object for this array. I already created it, therefore, I just copy it and paste it inside the C sharp code portion. This is the corresponding object of the response. Copy it. Paste it here. This is the dictionary response. And inside this object, we have phonetics array or list, and then we have meanings list. Inside the meanings list, we have meaning object. Inside the meaning object, we have part of speech and the definition is list. This is the base object definition. Inside the definition, we have definition and we have example. Therefore, this is the corresponding C sharp object of the response, namely this is the JSON object inside the response array. Now I have that object in C sharp. Since this is an array, therefore I need to create one array now. First, I will write the whole code and then I will explain each line.
I am using zero index here because in the response JSON, there is only one JSON object. Now the C-sharp code portion has been done. Now let me explain this. First, I have created dictionary response object based on the response on the GitHub. This is the response array for hello. Inside this response, there is one JSON object. Based on this object, I have created corresponding C-sharp object. This is the corresponding c -sharp object. Now let's compare it. For example, this is the word to be searched, word. Then it has phonetics list, phonetics array here. Then it has meanings array. This is the meanings list here. Inside the meanings object, there is part of speech, property, and the definitions array. This is the meaning object. Inside this object, part of speech property and the definition is array list. The most basic object is definitions. Inside the definitions, there is definition and the corresponding example. Therefore, inside this basic object, there is definition and example. Therefore, this is the corresponding C sharp object of this response. And this is an array. Therefore, I declared one array. Dictionary response array. Then I have declared two lists. One is for one for meanings and one for examples. Because some word has multiple meanings and each meaning has a corresponding example. Then I declared a parameter word because we are getting a word to be searched from the text box from the UI. Therefore, I created one parameter component parameter then in the text box if i enter the text and the text box value will be changed therefore i need event callback therefore i created this value changed event callback then i created corresponding on value changed event handler this is the event this three item are responsible for event buying them namely get the word from the text box and pass it to the api's url and we get the result this is the results meaning and the corresponding examples and we loop through this dictionary response and fill out this meanings list and in the meantime fill out this examples list therefore now we have meaning and now we have corresponding examples therefore we need to display it in the ui actually this meanings list and this example list properties inside the c -sharp code. This portion is the event binding and we are going to display these two lists in the HTML. Therefore, this is corresponding to property binding. Therefore, in this tutorial, I am going to explain two-way bindings. One is event binding. That event binding is bind the data from UI to the c -sharp code portion and another one is property binding that property binding will display the search result to the ui therefore this is property binding in this application i am going to present two-way bindings in the blazer web assembly applications now we have done the c -sharp code portion now we are going to display these results in the html portion First, I need one text box, then I need a button, the search button. If I enter a word in the text box and click the search button, it will pass that word to the API.
Now we are ready to create HTML portion. Actually, I have prepared it and I just copy it, paste it here. This is the HTML code I have prepared. Copy it. Clear this first. Paste it. Okay, now let's explain this. This is the page title, my English dictionary page. Then I have an input, namely a textbook here. Inside textbooks, I enter the placeholder, enter a word and get its definitions. Okay, then I have value. I, I assign it the word parameter here. Because this is the value of the textbox, the value will be bind by using this word parameter. This is the word parameter I have created and therefore the value, namely the enter text, will be resided inside this word parameter. Then I have an input event of the text box. Therefore I assign it, it on value change it. This is the on value change it. On value change it. Change event argus, we have the change it word. Namely, we have the newly entered word. This is newly entered word. I get it from the event argus and then invoked value changed here. Now, these three items are responsible for the event binding. We get the meanings, we get the response, and the loop through this response, we, we have filtered out the corresponding meanings and the corresponding examples. Therefore, we need to display this now. This is the header portion of the HTML table and this is the row portion of the table and the displaying meanings and each corresponding examples. Because we have multiple meanings and we have multiple corresponding examples, therefore I have used simple loop here. Now we are ready to run this. Okay, there is something is wrong. Search word. Okay, search word. Okay, okay, this is wrong. Search, this should be search word. Okay, this should be search word. I fixed it. For the C sharp code portion is done. Then HTML code portion also done. Inside HTML code portion, I have first, I check the dictionary response. If it is null, I will display no word to search. If it's not null, I will display the result in the HTML table. This is the table header and we have meanings and the corresponding examples column. And this is the actual data. Namely, this is the actual row for each meaning. Now save it. In the next step, I am going to display this component in the side navigation of this application. Actually, we have a side navigation inside this application. It is residing inside the shared folder. This is the side navigation bar and I am going to add it here. Therefore, I copy this. Paste it here. This is the dictionary component. I just call it here. Then this is the label. Save it. Now we are ready to run this application. Now I have saved all and let's see the application. Actually this application is running because I have run it by using the .NET watch run. Therefore, that application is running behind the scene. If I save something, it will automatically refresh. Now, let's see. Okay, it's refreshed. Now, I have dictionary page here. If I click this, it should be display a text box with a search button. Okay, now, I click this. Okay, now what to search? My English dictionary page and uh, I need to enter some word to search. For now I click search, it should be display the meaning and the corresponding examples here. Okay, it works. This is the meaning and this is the corresponding examples. Let's see another word. 
for example page page okay now this is the meaning and this is the example now let's try again english okay okay this is the meaning and this is the corresponding example in summary i have created a blazer web assembly component in inside this component i call it a free dictionary api i created a text box and then a button in if i enter something it will be get and pass to the api this portion is event binding i achieve that by using these three items here parameter namely word parameter this word is this is the parameter component parameter and the get word from text box get some element get some value from the ui portion therefore this is a parameter because we have a text box when we enter some word something is changed we need event handler therefore we have value changed event handler and then we have on value changed event here therefore these three items are responsible for event binding in the result of event binding we get the word to be searched and pass it to the api then we get the result and we are displaying the result this portion is the property binding i have explained two-way data bindings in the blazer web assembly applications you can find this project in the github i am going to put this project in the github and you may check all codes there actually i have put all codes inside my dictionary component because i am going to create a standalone component therefore i put all necessary stuff inside this component this is an album page created by using the templated component in this tutorial i am going to create this page from the scratch now let's start it this is a blazer web assembly project i just created it with default settings I am going to explain templated components by using an example. Namely, I am going to create an album by using the templated components in the Blazor WebAssembly application. In general, an album is a collection of photos or images. Therefore, in order to display some photos in the album, we need some data sources. Namely, we need photo data sources. In order to keep this tutorial as simple, I have prepared a static JSON data source to display in the album. Namely, I have prepared this static JSON data source to display in the Blazor templated component. This is an array. Inside of this array, there are multiple objects. First, I will copy this and create the same data source inside the project copy this I will put this data source inside the root folder because inside the root folder we have a sample data folder I will put it inside this sample data folder first clear this paste it here now save it now i have created the photo items json data source inside this array there are multiple json objects each json object represents a photo or an image it has full pass title description width and height in the photo object here I am taking photos from unsplash.com. Therefore, I have assigned unsplash's URL to the full pass. In the next section, I am going to create a photo item component based on this JSON object. Namely, that photo item component should have full pass, title, description, width, 
and height parameters. In general, components reside inside the pages folder. Now let's create it inside the pages folder. I don't need this. Now let's write component parameter based on the JSON object inside the JSON data source. This is the JSON object representing one photo. Therefore, I need to create component parameters based on these parameters. Namely, Save it. Now I have created component parameters based on the JSON object inside the JSON data source. Now I need HTML code for this component because I am going to display image and its heading and its description in the UI. Therefore, I need some HTML code to display it. Actually, in order to save time, I have prepared the HTML code for this component. This is the HTML code for the photo item component. Therefore, I just copy it, paste it here. Now, let me explain this. Save this. First, we have an image item here because we are going to display photo or image in the UI. Therefore, we need an HTML image item. This is the width and we have it here and this is the height and we have it here and this is the full pass of the photo or image and we have it here as a component parameter. Then we have heading. This is the heading and then finally we have description and this is the description component parameter. Therefore, all of these directive attributes comes from the outside of this component. This is the width of the component and it equals to the image width. Now save it. In the next step, I am going to create the templated component. The main goal of this tutorial. Now let's create the templated component. Because it is a template, it should be resided inside the share folder. First, I will write the code, then explain it line by line. First, start from the c -sharp code portion. Save it. Now I need to create the HTML portion. In order to save time, I have prepared the HTML portion. Therefore, first I copy this. And paste it here. Then I will explain it. Save it. Now I have completed all code including HTML 
and the C-sharp chords. First, we have C-sharp chord portion. Inside the C-sharp chord portion, we are using parameter. In this templated component, we are going to convert an ordinary HTML table to a templated component. Actually, instead of table cells, I am using this directive attribute. Namely, I am using this header parameter. This is a parameter. Type is render fragment because it's a fragment of the UI. It, in other words, it's a rendering portion of the UI. Therefore, I am using at table header instead of table cells. Then, then here we have table row. Import this and use this cell TD. Let's say I have commented out this and using this TD elements here. Now we have TR element. Inside this TR element, we have TD elements. Instead of this column cells, if I use a parameter, asset time, I can accept some value from outside this component. But in this case, I could not accept any value from outside of this component. Therefore, I just deleted this. Instead of that, I open this. I am going to use this row template parameter. This is a parameter. We have it here. And it pass, this parameter type is render type. It's going to render T items. This T items is a generic item. It could be anything. Therefore, inside the row template, if I templated it, I can display anything. Now the logic is same for the table foot. Now let's explain this. Actually, I am using here two simple loops. One is using row and one is using column. In fact, we have a list here. This is the list we are going to display inside this component. Actually, this list is one dimensional. Now I am changing it into two dimension by using this full loop. For example, I, I am going to change from this one dimensional list into this 2D array. Namely, I am going to display the pictures or I am going to display the images like just like this. Therefore, I changed it. Let's say inside this list, we have eight element. Therefore, I just divided it. Two row, four columns. The first row, second row. Each row have four elements here. Therefore, I have converted 1D list into 2D array. We should remember that row multiplied by columns equal to the total number of the items inside the list. Therefore, I have two rows and four columns here. The total is eight. Therefore, I have converted 1D list into 2D array in order to display in the UI. So I have explained the HTML code and the display logic here is the header portion and this is the row portion and this is the footer portion header row and the footer because the because this table already converted into table template therefore we are going to display any value namely we are going to display generic item inside this component then we have row here and we have columns here I have used it in order to convert the 1D list into 2D array in order to display the pictures on the album. Next step, I am going to create the album by using this templated component. Now let's create the album page. I will create the album page inside the pages folder. First, I will write the code, then I will explain line by line. First, we need a photo object. Therefore, I will create a photo class. 
as we know, inside the photo, we have some properties. For example, inside the photo object, we have full pass, title, description, width, and height. Therefore, Now I have created a photo class. Our data source is an array. Therefore, I need to declare one photo list. Now, let's get the data from the data source. We have static data source here. Now, I am going to read that data source into this photo item list. Therefore, I need some service. I am going to use HTTP client. Now we have the photo list. Now let's use the templated component we just created. This is a templated component we just created. It has header, row template, and the table foot template. Now we are ready to display the image inside this my table template. So therefore, first we need to give the array to display it. Because we have items. I assign this, this photos list. I will explain this context later. I am going to display in two row, therefore, and columns, four column. Now, let's fill the table head. Now I have a title, album page with templated blazer was some component. And then I have a line here. Now let's fill the row template. Because this is a row template, this itself is a row, TR element. Therefore, I just write the TD element here. That's it. Now let's fill the table foot. I am taking the pictures from unsplash.com. So therefore I would like to give a credit here. Save it. Now I have completed the HTML portion of this page. Namely, I have displayed the image in the album page. 
this is the row template and in the inside the row template I have called it the photo item object okay now let's explain this first I have created a photo class because in the data set we have JSON object this is the JSON object and this is an array this JSON object represents a photo therefore I created one photo class the class's property are corresponding to the JSON set data sets object we have full pass title description with this and height therefore same thing I have inside the, this photo class then because that data source is an array therefore I declared one list here photo list after that I have a write on initialize async method of this component inside this method I am getting the data by using the HTTP client this is the data source now I am getting the data by using the HTTP client and now in this photos list we, we have all the pictures to be displayed my template table has items therefore I have assigned this list then I have created a context I will explain this later then I have assigned it rows because I am going to display in two rows so therefore I assign it to then each row I am going to display four images or four pictures therefore column number is four and I have add some page title in the table header after that I have declared the photo item and display it inside the row template in the footer portion I have give credit to the unsplash.com finally the context attribute is very important now let's see it in detail this is the my template code portion we just saw that we just use that inside the my album first I assign it the photos list to the item actually this context is represents one item inside this list one item inside this list represent the context therefore I assign it one photo here this is the context then inside the template I am using this photo photo full pass photo title photo description photo videos and the photo height and I explicitly call it it here now I have called this context in the my table template namely in the template level actually I also can call this inside row template for example here I am not explicitly use it inside the template level but I am using it inside the row template because we are going to display elements inside row template therefore it is possible to use or it is possible to declare this context element inside the row template this in the above cases we have used the context element in the component level namely I have called it inside this line in the second case I have called it inside the row template actually I don't call it explicitly but I have used it implicitly namely I didn't call it explicitly anywhere and I just use it for example if I use context and full pass context title context description context videos and context therefore the context is just representing the photo item in other words the context attribute is representing the photo class to be displayed inside the, this row template in the above two case I have used it explicitly but in this case I may use it implicitly namely I may use the context keyword without any explicitly declare actually this context attribute implicitly pointing the photo item because we are assigning this photo list to the items inside the template therefore automatically the context element get on the photo object next step let's call this my album component in the side the navigation bar of this application we have the navigation bar here I just copy this the 
that is the label save it before run it i would like to summarize what i have done until now first i have created one photo items json data source this is a static json data source and this is an array inside this array we have multiple objects based on this object i have created photo item component to represent them each json object inside the static data source then i have created my table template namely this my table template is a templated component then by using this my table template i have created my album page finally i have coded this my album component inside the side navigation bar i have coded it here hopefully it will work now let's run this application now it's running okay let's see here okay it's running my album is here now let's click the my album hopefully it will display some images here now it works if i refresh it it will display new images here okay now we have completed album page with templated blazer web assembly component thank you for your watching please subscribe i am going to explain colon javascript based libraries or javascript functions inside the blazer web assembly apps this is a 3d pie chart created by using the javascript based libraries as an example i am going to create this 3d pie chart from by using javascript functions now let's start it this is a blazer web assembly project I just created it with default settings as i mentioned previously in this tutorial i am going to explain how we can call javascript based libraries or javascript functions in the blazer web assembly apps as an example i will use google chart tools this is the google chart tools homepage. you can find it developers.google.com there are many useful charts and their corresponding sources as stated here it is free to use now let's create pie chart in the blazer web assembly application this is a 3d pie chart it looks great therefore let's create this inside the blazer web assembly apps this is the corresponding javascript function for that 3d pie chart therefore i just copy it temporarily i will put this code in the notepad just paste it here this is the javascript function to draw that 3d pie chart and this is the ajax api now let's start coding first i will create a scripts folder inside the web root folder Then I will create a JavaScript function to draw the 3D pie chart. Now I am ready to copy the JavaScript function to draw the 3D pie chart. As I mentioned previously, this is the Ajax API of Google, and this is the function to draw that 3D pie chart. Therefore, I just copy this portion and paste it here. Now I have created the draw 3D pie chart JavaScript function. In the next step, I am going to call this function in the blazer web assembly apps 
in order to use this JavaScript function inside the Blazor application. First, I need to import this Ajax API in the index page. Therefore, I just copy it. Go to the index page. Just paste it here. In the next step, I need to import this charts.js file. Now we are ready to use this JavaScript function inside this project. First save it. In the next step, I am going to create a component to draw this 3D pie chart. In general, components reside inside the pages folder. Therefore, I will create the component in the pages folder. Now let's start to fill out the c -sharp code portion and the HTML code portion. First, I will write the whole code including HTML and the c -sharp portions. Then I will explain it line by line. Now I have completed the HTML and the c -sharp code portions of this component. Let me explain it. First, Microsoft JS Interpret has been imported, then injected iJS runtime. After that, I created some HTML elements. Namely, we are going to display the 3D pie chart in the UI. Therefore, we need some HTML codes and controls. First, I have created a heading colon JS from Blazor WebAssembly apps. Then, I have created a button. When I click this button, the pie chart will be show up. Therefore, in the button's unclick event, I have assigned this show chart function. I will explain it later. And then, we have a line. After that, I created a container, namely a div container to hold that 3D pie chart. This container has an ID of chart container div. Actually, this ID also exists inside the charts.js file, namely it is here. Meaning, we are going to display the pie chart in a container which has this ID. Therefore, this ID must be consistent with this container ID. This is very important. Then I have created a show credit boolean variable. 
if this boolean variable is true then i will show three d pie chart created by using google chart tools this is a credit now let me explain the issue of good portion it is easy understanding and it's very less code it's only one function inside this function by using js runtime i just invoked the joe 3d pie chart js function then this is a message that's it in the next step i am going to call this component in the side navigation bar of this application because we have a side navigation bar here therefore i just copy this portion paste it here call the pie chart component just here label now everything is done before on this application i would like to summarize what i have done until now first i have created charts js function inside this js function i have created a jaw 3d pychart js function actually this is the javascript function to draw the 3d pychart i got it from google chart tools homepage second in the index.html file, I have called it Google's Ajax API. This is the Google's Ajax API. Then I have imported the charts.js file. Third, I have created the pie chart component. I just explained it. Finally, I have called this pie chart component in the side navigation bar of this application. I just called it here. This is the label now let's run this application actually this the application is running behind the scene because i have run it by using dotnet water run therefore it's running behind the scene if i change something and save it the application updated automatically now let's see it it, it is running let me refresh it okay it's running Colon JS from Blazor WebAssembly apps, and we have the show chart button here. Hopefully, if I click this show chart button, the 3D pie chart will be show up here. Let's do it. Okay, it works. It looks great. Let me refresh it again. Click it again. Okay, it is running. We will discuss dependency injection in Blazor WebAssembly apps. As an example, first let's create a user service, then inject it in this project. For this, let's use JSON placeholder API. Since there are some user data, we may use it and display them in the application UI. This is the JSON placeholder API. You can find it by using this URL. There are many resources, for example, these resources however let's use this users data set it has 10 users inside this this is a json array there are 10 json objects this is the first object name the first user this is the second object namely the second user However, we don't use all elements inside object, only use the selected elements. First, let's create a user class by using the selected elements from the JSON object in the left. Later, we will use it to display these user data in the Blazor component. The user class should like this, and it has properties corresponding to the elements in the JSON object in the left. For example, we have ID, name, username, email, phone, and website. We just selected these elements. We use this user class to display the user data in the UI. Now, let's create it. First, 
let's create a folder namely Moodle's folder now let's create the user class user now let's fill out this class Finally, website. Save it. This is the user class we are going to use. In the next step, let's create services. First, create services folder. Now let's create service interface. I use a service. First, we create interface. We add a method I enumerable user get users because the users are array in the JSON dataset. Now, let's implement this service. User service. Inherit from a user service. HTTP HTTP JSON Now let's implement the method First we need to inject HTTP client Now let's implement the service method This is the service method to be implemented Just paste it here Async We get the data by use on the HTTP client. Return it. We need the JSON placeholder API URL. We have it here, copy it. Paste it here. Now we have the JSON placeholder API URL. Copy it, paste it here. Now the service class is done. URL, URL. Save it. Now we have completed the user service. In the next step, in order to use this service, we need to register this service in the program file. service and interface we need to register it inside the program class let's register it here build the services add scoped i use a service then the service okay we have implemented it okay we have registered it add scope it then build it now the service is available throughout this application in this step let's explain the service lifetime in the blazer web assembly apps they are three types of service lifetime in the blazer web assembly apps the first one scoped second is singleton and the third one is transient 
Scoped Sales instance is created per request. However, in the Blazor apps, scope of the service is per connection. So, scoped service behavior like a singleton service. The second one, singleton service instance is created and shared through the application lifetime. Blazor apps support this lifetime of service. The third one is transient. Service instance is created every time when it requested or needed. Okay, now we have the user class, we have the services. Next, let's create a component and consume this service. Available users component. Router template, available users. This is the router. First, let's write the code, then explain it. Import some namespaces, models, inject the user service. This is the user service we are going to use. Because now, now you okay user this is the user service a user service we have a method that method returns i enumerable user therefore we declare this users i enumerable now we are right the uninitialized async now we are ready to get the data by using the user service. We have a get user method. Okay. This is the C-sharp code portion of the component. Save it. Now let's write the HTML code portion of the component. Format it. Loading. We create a table. Columns of the table. ID, name, username, email, phone, and the website. Then body. Because our data is array, therefore we need to use for each. In the footer, we are going to display some credits for credits for JSON placeholder, namely data source. I am going to use, we are going to use a element. We have the URL of the JSON placeholder API. This is the URL. Copy it. Data source. Yeah. Paste it here. JSON placeholder. Available user component has been completed. If this is null, display this message. If it is not null, display the actual data, namely the user. This is a C-sharp code portion. And this is the HTML code portion, namely display data. Now let's explain this. Import some namespaces, then inject the service. This is the user variable. We are getting the user data by using the user services method. 
by using the user service. We have a get user message inside the service. Or this is the table. Hit the portion. Here we have columns. ID, name, username, email, phone, and the website. Then we have the rows. Because this is array, we are loops creating all rows by using the for each. This is a credit for JSON placeholder. This is the URL. Now the available user component has been completed. Now we need to call this component in the side navigation bar of this application because we have a side navigation bar here. Just copy this, paste it here. This is the available user component. We just call it here. Available user, label, available users. Now, everything is done. Before run this, let's summarize what we did until now. First step, based on the JSON placeholder user data, we have created a user class in order to display the data in the UI. In the second step, we have created our user service interface, then implemented it. Inside this service, we are getting the user data from the JSON placeholder API. Namely, in the second step, we have completed the our user service. In the third step, we have registered the user service in the program file. Now the service is available throughout this application. In the step four, we have created an available users component. Inside the component, we have injected I user service. And by using this service, we get the user's data. Finally, in the step five, we have called the available users component in the side navigation bar of this application. Now, let's run this application. .NET watch run. Now it's building. Okay, it's running. Now it's running. This is the available user. It's running. If I click this available user, it will display data here. Hopefully. Click it. Okay, it displays. Thank you for your watching. Please subscribe. We will discuss how to manage request routing with examples. The router component enables routing to razor components in a Blazor app. The router component is used in the app component of Blazor apps. First, let's see the app component. This is the router component and it is one of the most important components in the Blazor apps. Now, let's see router component in details. They are other components inside the router components. For example, found component, not found component, and the layout view, etc. When a Razor component with an add page directive is compiled, the generated component class is provided a route attribute specified on the component's route template. Meaning, if a component have page directive and it is compiled, that component will have route attribute. Specify on the components route template. Name the a segment in the URL to access this component. When the app starts, the assembly specified as the router's app assembly is scanned to gather route information for the app's components that have a route attribute. Namely, first the component is compiled, will have route attribute, then app assembly will gather all route information. At runtime, 
the route view component receives the route data from the router along with any parameters. In addition, inside the route view component, we have a default layout attribute. In the default layout attribute, we are assigning a main layout. Namely, the main layout is the default layout of this application. If we have a component and it doesn't have a layout directive, at set time, the main layout is the default layout for that component. However, Blazor project template specifies the main layout component as the app's default layout. In Blazor, components support multiple route templates using multiple add page directives. Now, let's create an example route component to show multiple page directives in a single Blazor component. In general, components reside inside the pages folder, therefore I will create that example route component inside the pages folder. Now, inside this example route component, I am going to add two route templates, namely Now I have added two different road templates inside this single example road component. In order to save time, I have prepared the HTML code portion of this component. Therefore, I just copy it and paste it here first. This is the HTML code for that component. Just copy it. First, clear this. Paste it here. Save it. Now I have completed the component with two different road templates. Namely, in Blazor, components support multiple road templates using multiple page directives. We have multiple page directives here. Meaning, this example component loads on request for first example road 1, then example road 2 as well. Now let's try to run this application and they're going to access the same page with using these two different road templates. Actually this application is running behind the scene, therefore if I save something and update something and save it, it will be updated automatically. Now let's see the page. Okay, I refresh it. The application is running. Now I am trying to access the newly created example road component by using the different road templates we just added. For example, for example, example road one and the example road two. Let's do that. First, let's try the example road one. Okay. The example road one template loads the page. At present, this component is displaying for example route 1. Now, I am going to try 2. If I enter here 2, okay, I have accessed the same page by using the second route template, namely example route 2. If I change it 1 again, okay, now let's try to access it. Okay, the same page loads again. In this example component, we have used two different road templates. The first one is example road one. The second one is example road two. We have accessed the same page by using these two road templates. In summary, components support multiple road templates using multiple add page directives. We have multiple add page directives inside this example road component. Therefore, this component has been accessed by using, the, by using these two different road templates. Now, let's see router parameter by using another example. The router uses road parameters to populate the corresponding component parameters with the same name. Road parameter names are in case sensitive.
Now let's create the road param component. Now I have created an example road param component. By using this component, I am going to show road parameters. Okay, I have created info property. This is a component property. However, we have a route template here. Inside the route template, we have a route parameter here. Now, I have completed this simple component. Save it. This route parameter has corresponding component property here. This is the corresponding component property for this road parameter. Therefore, by using this road parameter, we can populate corresponding component property. Let's display this info in here. Therefore, when we enter the browser in the info as a value, and it will be show up here. Therefore, in the application, Blazor WebAssembly works with all modern web browsers. Okay, now let's try it and uh, call this component by using this road template. Okay, let's see it. And it displays here. And therefore, Blazor WebAssembly works with all modern web browsers. This is the value of the road parameter. And it populates the, populates the corresponding component property. In addition, in Blazor applications, optional road parameter also supported. For example, after the info and this info road parameter will become optional. And then here, we create one initialize method, for example, protected. Now let's save it. Road parameter supports optional parameters. Blazor, namely, Blazor app supports optional road parameters. Now the info is optional road parameter. We have an initialized method. If the value of the info is not present, and it will be display this default value. Let's try this component. We see here browser. Now this browser is comes from the default value. That browser is comes from here, namely the default value, because it's optional. Therefore, we may assign it value or we may not assign it value. If we assign it value, it will be displayed directly here. If we don't assign it value, it will be show the default value. Now, let's see road constraints in Blazor apps. For this, I will create a user component. Save this. And we have added road template here. Inside the road template, we have ID, and this ID is integer. Actually, this is the road constraint portion of this URL, of this road template. In fact, 
road constraints enforces type checking in the URL. In other words, road constraints enforces type checking in the road template. Therefore, the road parameter ID only accepts integer values. If it is not integer, it won't work. Let's try to see it. Now the application is running. Based on this, I am going to enter user ID. I will give the ID 1, for example. Therefore, I will enter user slash 1. User slash 1. Now the ID. Now the template parameter ID is equal to 1. Namely, the ID equal to 1 and integer. Therefore, it should work. It should display user ID 1. Okay, it works. It displays user ID 1. This is the user component and it works for user ID 1. Its type is integer. Therefore, it worked. If I enter here a string, it won't work. Now, I have entered a string 1. Namely, I assign it the ID of the user a string. It won't work. Sorry, there is nothing at this address. Now, I try to give 100. It will be show up user ID 100. User ID 100. For example, it will work. Therefore, a road constraint enforces type checking on a road segment to a component. Now, let's see some invariant culture matching because this is related to road constraints. Constraints enforces type checking in the URL. Therefore, you may see that what element is have invariant culture and the type checking is matched or not matched. Thank you for your watching. Please subscribe. In this video, we will discuss how to consume reusable component from Razer class library. For this, first step, create a Razer class library project containing a Razer UI or component, for example, component 1. Second step, call a test API namely json place holder api in the component one above and display some test data on it after this step the component one is ready to reference it by a blazer WebAssembly app in the third step create a new blazer WebAssembly project and reference the razor class library project above finally we can consume the component one above in the blazer WebAssembly project now let's start it Create new project. Razor class library. Select this. With this selection, next. With this settings, click next. Now we are ready to create the Razor class library. Create. Now, we have created a Razor class library. Inside this project, we have WebRoot folder, import Razor, and the component one Razor, and the example interrupts. Let's see the component one. This is the component one created by default. First, we need to complete this component, namely we are going to display some data on this component. And then in the second step, we are going to call this component, namely we are going to consume this component on a Blazor WebAssembly application. For this, I need to install some NuGet packages. Let's install HTTP. Okay, 
Now we have installed system.net HTTP. Therefore, we can use HTTP client inside this component or inside this project. Now, let's write the c -sharp code portion of this component. In this component, we are going to display some test data. Namely, display some data from JSON placeholder API. First, let's see the data in the JSON placeholder API. This is the JSON placeholder API. There are some test data. We can display it in the component. For example, let's display this user data set. This is the user data set we are going to display in the component. There are 10 users in this data set. This is the first user. This is the second user. We are going to display this user in the component. We don't display all data, but we display some selected elements inside this JSON object. We are going to display ID, name, username, email, and phone, and the website. Only selected elements, namely these selected elements. Therefore, we need to create a class. In the JSON placeholder API, the user's data set is an array. Therefore, we need to create an array. This data set is an array. Inside this array, there are multiple JSON objects. Therefore, we need to create an array here. Now we are going to get data from JSON placeholder API by using HTTP client. Therefore, we need to put here JSON placeholders URL. Copy this URL. Paste it here. Clear this. Now save this. Now we have completed the C sharp portion of this component. In the next step, we are going to display this user data in this component. Therefore, we need some HTML code.
save it, we have completed the component. Namely, we have completed the component inside the Razor class library. Now, we are ready to use this component in the Blazor WebAssembly app. Before consume this component, let's explain this. First, we have completed the c -sharp code portion of this component. Here, we have created a user class. The properties of this class are corresponding to the elements in the JSON placeholder API. Namely, in the JSON placeholder, we have a user data set. Inside that data set, we have 10 users. Therefore, first, we create a class corresponding to the elements inside the JSON placeholder's data set. Because the data set inside the JSON placeholder is an array, therefore, we created one user's array. Then, we created an initialized async method. Inside this method, we get data from the JSON placeholder by using the HTTP client. Now, inside this array, we have all users' data. In the next step, we are going to display this data in the component. If the user is null, at the time, we will display this message, load them. If this is not null, we display that data in the HTML table. This is the HTML table to display the user's data set. This is the header portion of the table. Here we have six columns, namely ID, name, username, email, phone, and the website. Then in the table body, we have corresponding data. Because the user is an array, therefore we have used for each here and created all rows corresponding to the columns. Then in the table footer portion, added the credit to the data source. In the href, we have the URL of the JSON placeholder API. Now, the, this component one, namely a component inside the Razor class library, has been completed. And we are ready to use this component in Blazor WebAssembly apps. Namely, we are ready to consume this component in a Blazor WebAssembly application. In the next step, we are going to create a Blazor WebAssembly app project and inside the project, we are going to call this component. Now, let's do that. First, we need to create a Blazor WebAssembly app. Blazor WebAssembly app. With the selection next, consume component from Razor class library. Create. Okay. We have created a Blazor WebAssembly apps, namely consume component from Razor class library. In the first step, we need to reference the Razor class library. Therefore, okay, okay. Now we can use the component from the Razor class library inside this consume component from Razor class library project. First, I need to create a test component. In the next step, I am going to call that component. First, I need to input the class library project. We have referenced the Razor class library project. Therefore, for in the first step, before you use it, I need to import it. Namely, I have imported here Razor class library. Now, I am ready to use the component one.
the component name is component one. Therefore, I added the raw template, then I import the Razor class library. In the second step, I call it the component one because this component one is already completed inside the Razor class library. Therefore, after I import Razor class library, I can use the component. Hopefully, it will work. Now the test Razor component has been completed. In the next step, I am going to call this component in the side navigation bar of this application because we have a side navigation bar here. Therefore, I just copy this. Here, I just call the test component. Test. And then this is the label. Razor class library test save this now we are ready to run this application it's building application is running we just created this navigation menu and if i click this menu hopefully the users will display here okay it works actually this content inside this red line is coming from the Razor class library. First, we created a class library project. Inside the class library project, we created a component. Then, inside that component, we call it JSON's placeholder API, and we get some user's data and display it by, by using HTML table. Then, after complete that Razor class library, we Referenced the Razor class library inside the Blazor WebAssembly app, and uh, we created the test component inside the consumer application, and then we use it, we consume it the component one from the Razor class library. This is the result. Thank you for your watching. Please subscribe. In this video, we will discuss even callbacks in Blazor WebAssembly apps. There are many scenarios to explain even callbacks. However, here we will explain this topic by using a nested component. Namely, first we will create a child component, then call it inside a parent component, and expose events across components by using an even callbacks. Now, let's start it. For this, first, we will create a child component. In order to save time, I have prepared the code for this child component. Therefore, I just copy it and paste it here. This is the code for child component. I have prepared it. Therefore, just copy it. Copy. Select all. First clear this. Just paste it here. Now save this. We have completed the child component. Now let's create a parent component. We created the parent component. In order to save time, I also prepared the code for this parent component. First, I will copy the code and paste it here. Then, I will explain the child and the parent component together. This is the code for this parent component. Therefore, I just copy it. First, clear this and paste it here. Save this. Now, we have created two components. The first one is child component. The second one is parent component. Now, let's explain these two components in details. This is the child component we just created. Inside the child component, we have a button. 
in the buttons on click event we have assigned on click callback this on click callback and event callback inside this component receives delegates from outside of this component since we are going to consume this child component inside the parent component at that time this child component will become one of the portion of the parent component therefore we need this render fragment namely render fragment child component as a parameter then finally we have a parameter we have a property of this component is uh, that's on click callback actually it's type it typed with most event arguments and it is an event callback this component receive it delegate or delegate events from outside meaning we are going to consume this component inside the parent component then we are going to assign some events that event will be received by using this property here just like here okay how a buttons on click handler is set up to receive an event callback delegate from the parent component the event callback is typed with most event args which is appropriate for an on click event from a peripheral device therefore this child component will be consumed inside the parent component and then receives an event callback delegate from the parent let's see how we consume this child component this is a very simple parent component we just created first we have a router template then we have a h1 heading parent child example then we have consumed the child component we just created then we have a message showing message here we have a paragraph here then inside the c sharp code portion we have a parameter message then we have a message here show message this show message is receiving most event args then displays the message this message will be called when we click the on click callback namely the child component is a button therefore when we click this button this message will be called then the message is updated and displayed in the parent component second a call to the state has changed is it required in the callbacks method namely in show message third state has changed is called automatically to render the parent component just as child events trigger component rendering in event handlers that execute within the child therefore state has changed is automatically called when parent component is rendered in the next step let's call this parent component in the side navigation bar of this application this is the side navigation bar therefore i just copy this portion just paste it here and call the parent component just here okay parent component this is the label save this before run this let me summarize what we have done until now first we have a created child component inside the child component we have a button in the buttons on click event we have assigned on click callback this is the on click callback of this component namely this is the on click callback property of this component meaning uh, this child component going to receive an event callback delegate from outside namely receiving some event callback delegate where this component is consumed okay then we have created a parent component and we consumed this child component we just created and then we have assigned it it's on click callback event callbacks and then we have set this parent components show message to the child components on click callback hopefully when we click the child component namely when we click a button in the ui it will be trigger this message
namely it will be sugar the parents message let's see this okay now let's run this application and uh, let's see the result now it's building now it's loading now the application is running and we have event callback here if i click this event callback menu hopefully it will be show up a button here okay now we have parent child example and we have a button and it says sugar parent component method this button is in the child component namely this button is the child component therefore and uh, we have stated here this button is in the child component if i click this and a message from parent component will be show up here namely this message is from parent component in this tutorial we have discussed it even callback in blazer web assembly apps thank you for your watching please subscribe in this video we will discuss blazer web assembly edit form the blazer framework supports web forms with validation using the edit form component bound to a model that uses data annotations to demonstrate how an edit form component works with data annotation validation, we will use an example model type along with annotation attributes. First, we will define a form by using the Blazor Frameworks edit form component. Then, add form annotation attributes and display validation error messages for invalid inputs when submit the form. Finally, for valid inputs, Display submitted information in the text area control as a simulation of the input data processing. Now let's start it. We just created this Blazor Web Assembly project. First, we will create an example component. Let's create a component inside the pages folder. Now the edit form example component has been created. First, let's create the router template. We need to import system component model data annotations. Now let's create the C sharp portion of this component. First of all, we need to create an example model class. Now let's add corresponding annotation attributes for form validation.
Now let's declare an example model. Also declare an output variable. Now let's override an uninitialized method and initialize the date time. Save this. Next, let's create a handle valid submit. Namely, let's create a method. When we click submit button, that method will be called at the submit data. Save this. Now we have completed the C-sharp code portion of this component. Let's work on the HTML code portion of this component. Because we are going to display a form and then user input some data and then we click the submit button. At that time, this, this C-sharp code portion will be processed that data. Basically, we have an example model class here. Inside this class, we have several items, namely several properties. And these properties will be displayed in the edit form. Therefore, we need to create HTML code here. Basically, as we described it in the introduction portion, in this component, we are going to use edit form. In order to use some data inside the edit form, we need to use model first. And we have created this model. Actually, this example model is created for this model. Then we are going to submit this form. Therefore, we need unvalid submit even here. We have created this message, handle valid submit. Therefore, just copy this and paste it here. Okay, now we have model and on valid submit method. This is the handle valid submit method. Will be called when the form submitted. As we described it previously, we are going to validate the input data. Therefore, we need data on orientation validator and the valid summary here. We need valid summary here in order to display invalid message. Now, we have added data on orientation validator, then added validation summary. Now, let's add the controls. In Blazor, we have several built-in data input components. Later, we will discuss them and uh, display some of them. First, we need to check this. First, we have label, then corresponding input text here. Now, we have completed the control for name. 
actually we have email date and uh, pin and therefore i just copy this and uh, change it now let's end the date we have some area here actually in this component when all inputs are valid if we click the submit button the result will be displayed in a text area so therefore first we need to create a button name the submit button then after submit button it click it the valid input namely the output will be displayed in a text area therefore first we add a button name the submit button Let's check this first. Save this. Now, let's explain this component. First, we have created an edit form example one. Namely, we have created a component. Then, imported system component model data annotation since we are going to display some validation messages if the form inputs are valid we can submit this form if they are not valid we can submit this form and uh, we will display some validation error therefore we have used data annotations validator then we have used validation summary here edit form component has a property of model as therefore we have we created a model in the c -sharp code portion and then we have assigned the example model name the example model object to the model of the edit form then we have assigned handle validation submit method to the unvalid submit event of the edit form therefore first we need to explain the c -sharp code portion in C sharp code version, first we have created an example model class. In this example model class, we have several properties, including name, email, pin, date, and the agree. We are going to validate form. Therefore, we have added required attribute. Then we have added some other attributes. For example, the name should be inside the 20 characters. If the name, if the input name exceeds 20, a set time error message, namely, name is too long. This message will be shown. Then we have created email inside email. This is also required field. If the number of character inside the email address exceeds 50, a set time and the valid email message will be displayed because this is email and we have added email address attribute then we have added pin number 
in order to explain this range we have added pin number and this is a required field and its range is from 1000 to this 999 namely it is four digit okay then we have added required field date time this is date time and then we have added uh, this i agree this is a boolean type and this is also we are using range attribute and in this case we have used type of boo because we are going to represent this boolean value in the edit form by using a checkbox if the checkbox is not checked this form this allows not aggregate user info this message will be show up now okay save this after we create this example model we created some messages for example uh, we have created an initialized method inside this method we are uh, we are initializing the example date time today we are assigning the date today date time today and then uh, we created one method handle valid method this method will be called this method will be called when we submit this form when we submit this form if everything is okay at that time this message will be show up in the text area for example form has been submitted with the following info first name display name then second is email display email and the third is example pin and then finally agree or not will be displayed therefore this output namely this output will be displayed in a text area just simulation of the processing this data the input data are not valid this message not be called at that time these error messages will be displayed uh, we have added uh, some html codes here okay first we have created input text this is a text box input text is a built-in control in blazer framework and then inside the text box we are going to enter name and we bind it bind the value and actually this is binding data and this value will be binded here then we have an email this is also a text box but this text box as shown here only accepts emails if the input is not email it will be show up this error message then uh, we have uh, created one input text its pin number inside this pin number this pin number will be four digit number if it's uh, a five digit or if it's one digit as a time error message validation message will be show up then this is a built-in checkbox in blazer frameworks and we are using this here then finally we have a submit button after inputs is ok and the submit button clicked we will display the result in the input text area this is a text area uh, this text area is we have assigned eight rows here and this is the bind value this is the output namely this output here if everything is ok if this handle valid message is called and this message namely this the value of the, this output variable will be displayed in the input text area now this component has been completed before run this component i will add this component to the side navigation bar of this application actually we have a side navigation bar here this is side navigation then i just copy this portion and paste it here I just call the edit form example here this is the label save now let's run this application
Okay, let's check this application because we have some error here. Actually, we have an input date control here. So therefore, I just replaced it. Okay, now save this. Now we have some error. Basically, I, I copied this. I just put it here in case. Okay, now it seems to be okay. Save it. Okay, we have some error here. Now let's, okay. Save this. Now let's check this. Now we have an error here, example model pin. And then therefore this is actually in the let's change it to string. Save this. Now let's see. Save all. Now let's see this application. Now let's run this application by using .NET watch run. Now the application is running. If I click this edit form example one, a form will be displayed here. Okay, the form has been displayed here successfully. We have a name, email, date, pin, and a text box. Finally, we have a submit button. In this case, if I now click the submit button, a validation error should be displayed. Let's see it. Okay, now it works great. Now, without any information, I click the submit button. This validation error has been displayed. It works great. After I enter some valid information and then I will click it, it will be displayed the input information here in a text area. Therefore, let's do it. Okay. We have date today. Okay. Then let's input one for digit. Then now I have input some valid data. Therefore, if I click the submit button, this information will be displayed here. That is actually simulation of the data processor. Okay, let's do that. Okay, now form has been submitted with following info. Name, John Doe, email, pin, and I agree to. Therefore, this form is works. If I uncheck this, Okay, this time, this form, this allows not aggregate user info. This is working great. And if I delete this email and click again, it will be show up this email message. The email field is required. This form is working correctly. Uh, until here, we have introduced built-in edit form component in Blazor frameworks. Actually, there are other built-in components in Blazor Frameworks. Now, let's see them. Blazor Framework provides built-in form components to receive and validate user inputs. Inputs are validated when they are changed and when a form is submitted. Available input components are shown in the table on the right. Inside this table, we have two columns. The first column is input components, and the second the column is rendered as. For example, this is the input checkbox component. We have used it, and it will be rendered as input type checkbox. Namely, this is the HTML form of this component. In this tutorial, we have used it input checkbox. We also use it input date. We also use it input text and we also use it input text area. For other components we didn't use in this tutorial, you may check using this URL. If you check this site, you can find the explanation, examples and some other information about these built-in form components in Blazor Framework. Thank you for your watching. Please subscribe. Blazor WebAssembly State Management with Cascading Value Component. There are multiple ways to share state across a Blazor WebAssembly app. In this video, we will discuss state management by using the Cascading Value Component in Blazor apps. For this, first 
we will create a page navigation component and consume it in a component which displays many records, namely by using a display comments component or page. Second step, we implement state management by using the cascading value component in the display comments page above. Third step, click pagination links and display some records on it. Then navigate away the display comments page and visit other pages in the app. Finally, we come back and navigate to the display comments page again. At that time, the active page link that was active when we navigate away should be unchanged and still be active, meaning the pagination link state is preserved even if we have visited other pages and come back again. Now, let's start it. This is a Blazor WebAssembly project we just created. First, let's create the pagination component. Let's implement a pagination which is just displayed in the Bootstrap homepage. First, let's look at the Bootstrap homepage. This is the pagination page in Bootstrap. This is the pagination template we are going to implement in this tutorial. First, let's see this template in detail. If we see this template carefully, we have several items there. Namely, we have text, for example, previous, one, two, three, or next. Then we have page index. For example, this is the page index one, page index two, page index three. And uh, now this page index two is active. If we point three as a time, this next is disabled. Therefore, we have to have a parameter enabled or disabled. In summary, in this page item, in this single page item, we have four elements, text, page index, enabled, and the active. In the next step, we are going to create an object, namely a page item object. First, let's create a models folder. Let's create a page item class. We have four property in this page item. We just saw that we have text, page index, enabled, and active. Therefore, Okay, save this. Now, let's create a constructor. Let's save this. Now we have created our page item class. Inside this class, we have text, we have page index, enabled, and active. And then we have a constructor. Next step, let's create a pagination component. In general, components reside inside the pages folder. Therefore, In order to save time, I have prepared the HTML and the C-sharp code portions of this component. Therefore, first I will copy this code and paste it here. Then I will explain the code line by line. This is the prepared code for this pagination component. Therefore, first I will copy this. Copy. First I will clear this paste it here. Save this. Okay, we have some error here. Let's see this object. Okay, we have some error here. Save this. Now, let's explain this code. 
we just created this page item. In the page item class, we have text, page index, enabled, active, and we have a constructor here. This constructor accepts page index, enabled, and text. Okay, now let's see. First, let's explain the C sharp code portion. First, we need to create the page link. All page links reside inside the list. Therefore, we have created a page items list because in the pagination component, we have several, namely, we have multiple page links. Therefore, we need a list here. Then we have page index from outside the component. We are passing page index. Therefore, we need this page index parameter. This is a parameter. Then we need total pages because we are going to display multiple records. Therefore, we need total page parameter. This is a parameter. Then we need a radius. This is the number of page links displayed in the pagination component. Then we have an event callback. When we select the page link, unselected page will be called. Then we have unset parameter because we are going to set parameter outside from this component. Inside this unparameter set, we are creating the, the content of the pagination component. This is the content of the pagination component. Inside the pagination component, first we need to create a previous link. If the page index is larger than one at that time, we have previous. The page index should be larger than one. Actually, previous page index is current page index minus one. Then create the page item. This is the constructor of the page item. First, we have page index, then we have enable it, and then we have text. Therefore, this is the previous page index. This, has, this is a Boolean value, has previous page, yes, and then we have the text. Now we have created the previous page. Then we create other elements. If the radius is larger than total page, at that time radius is equal to total page minus one. Then we use the for loop, simple for loop, loop through the total page, create each page links. For example, if this index should be between page index minus radius and it should be less than page index plus radius then we are going to create page items. Page item index, this is boolean, active, enable it, and this is the text, for example, one, two, three, four. Then we give the active. If we click, it, it will be clickable. Therefore, each page item should be active. Then we create the next page or next page link. Has next page, if the current page index less than total pages, at that time, we have next page. Therefore, this is the next page item, boolean. Then we have next page index. Next page index, current page index, and the plus one. Then we are going to create the page item by using the next page index, and has next page boolean value, and this is the text of next. Now, we have created the previous page link. We have created the all other page links, then finally we have created the next page link okay now we have created the pages after that when we select the page link it should be display or it selected a page namely we are going to select a page page index at that time we are going to display some data therefore we need this event event callback this event callback receives page item if the page index equal to the current page index, return. If the page item is not enabled, at that time also we return. This is the conditions because this page item is equal to page item is not changed, we will return. Then if the page item is disabled, namely it is not enabled, and at that time we also return. After that, this is the current page index and this is the received page index. Then unselected callback and we are invoking async page index. Namely, we are selecting that page index. In the HTML code portion, we are creating the UI portion of the page links. Actually, this is the code same as the pagination template in the Bootstrap homepage. We are loop through page items 
and then create them each page links here uh, first each links is active and then we have here CSS page links is active we active it and if page links is enabled and sometimes it's not active and sometimes it's enabled and sometimes it's not enabled as uh, therefore we added this CSS then we have uh, a page text here in the page links namely the label of the page link then we have unclick event if we click that page link is this select current page even callback will be called and then it will be invoke this unselected page even callback now we have completed the pagination component in the next step let's create a display comments component inside that component we are going to consume this pagination component actually there is a json placeholder test api inside this test api there are multiple records in this tutorial let's use this comments records there are 500 comments let's see this this is an array inside this array there are multiple comments namely there are 500 comments this is a record and this is a json object inside this object we have post id id name email and the comment body therefore we need a class to represent uh, an object first let's create a comment object we just saw that in the json placeholder apis comment array inside that object we have several elements namely we have post id id name email and body therefore we are creating this class save this in the next step let's create the display comments component In order to save time, I have prepared the HTML and the c code portions of this display comments component. Therefore, first I will copy that code and then paste it here. After that, I will explain the code line by line. This is the code I have prepared. I just copy it. Paste it here. Save this. now let's explain the code line by line first let's explain the c-sharp code portion first we have created a comment class namely this comment object represents a single object inside the comments array in the json placeholder api then we created a comments array here all comments array because we are going to get all comments and then later we will display it in the pagination component then we create a second array each time we click a pagination link and this will be displayed first we have a page index then we have items per page for example 25 and then we have initialized total pages for example one we have an initialized async inside an initialized async we are getting all comments by using the http client because we have http client here we have injected this service then by using this http client we are getting all comments by using http client this is the url of the comments if this is not null at that time we are getting the total pages because we have the count of this all comments and we have for example we have 25 items per page therefore this is the total pages namely number of objects and then we divide it by the items per page we are getting total pages then after we get the total page skip zero and we are getting the comments this is the initialized comment which will be displayed when the page loaded first time then after we select a page link at that time we will display 
comments. For example, this is the page index, the current page index, using this page index and the minus one, multiplying items per page, this is the skip count. For example, if we are clicking page link two, asset time two minus one is one, each page has 25 item. Therefore, this is a skip item from all comments. We are skipping this much and then taking items 25. This is the comments array when we click a single page link in the pagination component. Let's see the HTML code portion. Inside HTML code portion, we have a HTML table, simple HTML table, uh, because we have ID, we have name, we have email and body. Therefore, this is the table header and uh, this is the corresponding rows, namely the actual data. Therefore, we have a comments array and we loop through using the for each and uh, creating each row here. This is one row and we are looping through and creating all rows here. In the table footer portion, we are consuming the pagination component we just created. For example, in the pagination component, we have total pages, and this is the total pages. Then we have page index, this is the current page index, and we have radius 3. This means at first time, namely previous 1, 2, 3, and the next. Total 5 page links. Previous 1, 2, 3, and the next. Therefore, radius is 3. Then we have unselected page. This is the method we have here. Namely, each time click the page link, as a time this method will be called. And inside this method, we are getting comments based on the selected page link. Now the component is completed. Before run this, let's call this component in the side navigation bar of this application. We have a side navigation bar here. Okay, I just copy this. This is the router template. I just copy this, paste it here, and then okay, save this. Now we have completed our components. Namely, first we have created the page nation component. Then we have created display comments component and inside this display comments component, we have implemented the pagination component and displaying comments page by page. In the next step, we are going to implement state management, the main goal of this tutorial. First, let's run this application and this see. Let's run this application by using .NET Watch Run. Now it's running. Therefore, let's see. Now this application is running, for example. Okay, application running. And we have display comments here. If I click this menu, it will be show up some comments here. For example, okay. Now it works our pagination component also works okay this is the second page because we are going to display 25 elements in a page third page 25 100 okay now the pagination component working great okay let's put the title here now the title is not visible therefore we need to fix this. Actually, here we need to background. Okay, now save this. Okay, now comments pagination test. Now let's change the page size, namely items per page. Let's say five and save this. It will be loaded automatically because we are using .NET Watch Run. Okay, each page we have five records. For example, okay, it works great. If we come here, next, next. Now this is disabled. Okay. Now the pagination component working great. 
Now we are in the page 10, displaying record 50. If I navigate away this page and visit other pages and come again at set time, page 10 is not active again. It is pointing page 1 because we didn't implement state management in this page yet. Let's do that. If I visit this counter, for example, I count this, and if I go to the home page, and uh, if I go to fresh data, and then come again, this display comments, at that time, it will be show up the first page. Namely, first page is active. Point on the first page link. Let's see. Meaning, in this application, there is no state management yet. Therefore, we need to implement state management. The name that we are going to implement state management by using cascade and value. Now let's implement it. For that, first we need to create a component, namely page index state provider. In the shared folder, let's create a component page index state provider. Inside this component, we are going to use cascade and value component. This. Now, let's create the C-sharp code portion. Because we are going to preserve or we are going to keep the state of the page index. Therefore, okay, now we have child content here. We just call it here. That's it. Save this. Now we have created page index state provider. Namely, by using this page index state provider component, we are going to keep the state of the page index across the application. In order to share this page index value across the application, first we need to call this component inside the main layout component. First, we have main layout component just here. We just call it. Here, we just call this component, namely page index state provider component. Save this. That's it. We just wrap this body portion by using the page index state provider component, meaning page index value shared across the application because we use this page index state provider inside the main layout. Therefore, this page state provider provides the state for all this body element. Save this. Let's come here in the display component. We just call that and share the page index across the application. First, in the C sharp code portion, we just call here cascade and parameter, then page index provider. We just call it state. Okay, now we have we have state. Actually, this state is the page index state provider component. Inside this component, as we see that, we have page index. Therefore, we don't need this page index now. Comment this. Instead of this page index, we are going to use this state. Namely, we are going to use the page index inside this state object. Okay, first, inside on initialize async, initialize this comments, which will be displayed when the page loads first time. When the page loads first time, we are skipping zero, namely we are displaying the first page. Therefore, we are skipping zero and taking five items each time. 
tia when we load first time we are displaying the first five item because we are skipping zero however if we go on to keep the state namely the page link state when we navigate away therefore we need to create a skip amount here we are going to create a skip count here it should be items for a page multiply by state page index the current page index and minus one this is the skip count when we navigate away that page therefore instead of zero we call this skip count okay this is the first step in the second step because now we don't have this page index variable therefore instead of this we are going to use state page index okay instead of this we are also use the state page index okay that's it save this okay now in another place here also we use state dot page index save all now it should be share the page index across the application okay before run this i will explain what i have done until now first we have created a page index state provider component inside this component we have created child content because this child content is rendered because we use render type because this will be a portion of the consumer component therefore we use it child content then we have page index we are going to share this page index across application therefore inside the main layout we just wrap this body portion inside this page index state provider that's it now we are able to keep this page index value across the application first we use this cascading parameter and then we declare this state actually this state is the page index state provider component inside the component we just saw that we have page index therefore we don't need this page index anymore I just commented it now if we run this application the state of the page index should be preserved in the display comments page okay let's see that save this okay refresh this in case now let's see and let's see display comments okay it displays but we have an issue here because we don't have any active page here therefore we need to fix this okay first let's see this inside this component we just commented this actually this is initial value is one therefore inside this page index state provider we have page index here this should be one therefore one okay save this now it should be fixed okay now okay uh, let's refresh this okay it's fixed it. okay i navigate away in this okay come again it's one okay now let's check this first we navigate some page now i am in the page seven namely page link seven is active now if i navigate again and come again this page and uh, go to other pages and come again it should be seven okay home here for example i navigated some other pages and now if i come again it should be displays the content of the page seven okay let's click this okay it's still seven okay now try again let's do that i am in the page 20 record 100 for example now i navigate again and come again it should be 20. now come again it should be page 20 and it displays 100. okay 
100, page 20. It works. Let's summarize this. In this tutorial, we have implemented state management by using cascade and value component. First, we have created a pagination component. Then we have created the display comments component. In inside this display comments component, we have implemented this pagination component. And then display recorders by using this pagination component. After that, in order to preserve the state of the pagination component, we have implemented page management by using cascade and value. Thank you for your watching. Please subscribe. Laser web WebAssembly pagination component. In this video, first we will create a pagination component by using the following pagination template. This is the pagination template we are going to implement in this tutorial. Then create a consumer component, namely a display comments component which displays many comments or recorders. Finally, we will consume the pagination component in the display comments component. Now let's start it. First, let's create the pagination component. Let's implement a pagination which is just displayed in the Bootstrap homepage. This is the pagination page in Bootstrap. This is the pagination template we are going to implement in this tutorial. Let's see this template in detail. If we see this template carefully, we have several items there. We have text, for example, previous, one, two, three, or next. Then we have page index. For example, this is the page index one, page index two, page index three. And uh, now this page index two is active. If we point three as a time, this next is disabled. Therefore, we have to have a parameter enabled or disabled. In summary, in this page item, in this single page item, we have four elements. Text, page index, enabled, and active. In the next step, we are going to create an object, namely a page item object. First, let's create a models folder. Let's create a page item class. We have text, page index, enabled, and active. Therefore, Okay, save this. Now, let's create a constructor. Let's save this. Next step, let's create a pagination component. In general, components reside inside the pages folder. Therefore, in order to save time, I have prepared the HTML and the C sharp code portions of this component. Therefore, first I will copy this code and paste it here. Then I will explain the code line by line. This is the prepared code for this pagination component. First I will copy this. Copy. First I will clear this. Paste it here. Save this. Okay, we have some error here. Let's see this object. Okay, we have some error here. Save this. Now, let's explain this code. First, let's explain the c -sharp code portion. We need to create a page link. All page links reside inside the list. 
therefore we have created a page items list because in the pagination component we have multiple page links therefore we need a list here then we have page index from outside the component we are passing page index therefore we need this page index parameter then we need total pages because we are going to display multiple records therefore we need total page parameter this is a parameter then we need a radius this is the number of page links displayed in the pagination component then we have an event callback when we select the page link unselected page will be called then we have answered parameter because we are going to set parameter outside from this component inside this on parameter set we are creating the content of the pagination component this is the content of the pagination component inside the pagination component first we need to create a previous link if the page index is larger than one at that time we have previous the page index should be larger than one actually previous page index is current page index minus one then create the page item this is the constructor of the page item first we have page index then we have enable it and then we have text therefore this is the previous page index this is a boolean value has previous page yes and then we have the text now we have created the previous page then we create other elements if the radius is larger than total page at that time radius is equal to total page minus one then we use the for loop simple for loop loop through the total page create each page links for example if this index should be between page index minus radius and it should be less than page index plus radius then we are going to create page items page item index this is boolean active enable it and this is the text for example one two three four then we give the active if we click it will be clickable therefore each page item should be active then we create the next page or next page link has next page if the current page index less than total pages at that time we have next page therefore this is the next page item boolean then we have next page index next page index current page index and plus one then we are going to create the page item by using the next page index and has next page boolean value and this is the text of next now we have created the previous page link we have created the all other page links then finally we have created the next page link okay now we have created the pages after that when we select the page link it should be display the page at that time we are going to display some data therefore we need this even even callback this even callback receives page item if the page index equal to the current page index return if the page item is not enabled at that time also we return this is the conditions because this page item is equal to page item is not changed we will return then if the page item is disabled at that time we also return after that this is the current page index and this is the received page index then unselected callback and we are invoking async page index namely we are selecting that page index in the html code portion we are creating the ui portion of the page links actually this is the code same as the pagination template in the bootstrap home page we are loop through page items and then creating each page links here uh, first each links is active and then we have here css page links is active we active it and if page links is enabled and sometimes it's not active and sometimes it enabled it as therefore we added this css then we have a page text here in the page links namely the label of the page link then we have unclick event if we click that page link is this select current page event callback will be called and then it will be invoke this unselected page 
event callback. Now we have completed the pagination component. In the next step, let's create the display comments component. Inside that component, we are going to consume this pagination component. Actually, there is a JSON placeholder test API. Inside this test API, there are multiple records. In this tutorial, let's use this comments records. There are 500 comments. Let's see this. This is an array. Inside this array, there are multiple comments. Namely, there are 500 comments. This is a record and this is a JSON object. Inside this object, we have post ID, ID, name, email, and the comment body. Therefore, we need a class to represent uh, an object. First, let's create the comment object. We just saw that in the JSON placeholder APIs comment array inside that object, we have several elements. Namely, we have post ID, ID, name, email, and body. Therefore, we are creating this class. Save this. In the next step, let's create the display comments component. In order to save time, I have prepared the HTML and the C-sharp code portions of this display comments component. Therefore, first I will copy that code and then paste it here. After that, I will explain the code line by line. This is the code I have prepared. I just copy it. Paste it here. Save this. Now, let's explain the code line by line. Let's explain the C-sharp code portion. First, we have created a comment class. Namely, this comment object represents a single object inside the comments array in the JSON placeholder API. Then, we created a comments array here, all comments array, because we are going to get all comments and then later we will display it in the pagination component. Then we create a second array. Each time we click a pagination link and this will be displayed. First, we have a page index. Then we have items per page, for example, 25. And then we have initialized total pages, for example, one. We have an initialized async inside an initialized async we are getting all comments by using the http client because we have http client here we have injected this service then by using this http client we are getting all comments by using http client this is the url of the comments if this is not null at that time we are getting the total pages because we have the count of these all comments and we have, for example, we have 25 items per page. Therefore, this is the total pages, namely number of objects. And then we divide it by the items per page. We are getting total pages. Then after we get the total page, skip zero and we are getting the comment. This is the initialized comment which will be displayed when the page loaded first time. Then, after we select a page link, at that time, we will display comments. For example, this is the page index, the current page index. Using this page index and minus one, multiplying items per page, this is the skip count. For example, if we are clicking page link two, at that time, two minus one is one, each page has 25 items, therefore this is a skip item. From all comments, we are skipping this much and then taking items, 25. This is the comments array when we click a single page link in the pagination component. Let's see the HTML code portion. Inside HTML code portion, we have a 
HTML table, simple HTML table uh, because we have ID, we have name, we have email and body. Therefore, this is the table header and uh, this is the corresponding rows, namely the actual data. Therefore, we have a comments array and we loop through using the for each and creating each row here. This is one row and we are looping through and creating all rows here. In the table footer portion, we are consuming the pagination component we just created. In the pagination component, we have total pages and this is the total pages. Then we have page index. This is the current page index and we have radius 3. This means at first time, namely previous 1, 2, 3 and the next total 5 page links. Previous 1, 2, 3 and the next. Therefore, radius is 3. Then we have unselected page. This is the method we have here. Namely, each time click the page link, as a time this method will be called. And inside this method, we are getting comments based on the selected page link. Now the component is completed. Before run this, let's call this component in the side navigation bar of this application. We have a side navigation bar here. Okay, I just copy this. This is the router template. I just copy this, paste it here, and then okay, save this. Now we have completed our components. Namely, first we have created the pagination component. Then we have created display comments component and inside this display comments component we have implemented the pagination component and displaying comments page by page. First let's run this application and see. Let's run this application by using .NET Watch Run. Now it's running, therefore let's see. Now this application is running, for example, okay, application running. And we have display comments here. If I click this menu, it will be show up some comments here. For example, okay, now it works. Our pagination component also works. Okay, this is the second page because we are going to display 25 elements in a page. Third page, 75, 100, okay. Now, the pagination component working great. Okay, let's put the title here. Now, the title is not visible, therefore, we need to fix this. Actually, here, we need to background Okay, now save this. Okay, now comments pagination test. Now let's change the page size, namely items per page. Let's say five and save this. It will be loaded automatically because we are using .NET Watch Run. Okay, each page we have five records. For example, okay, it works great. If we come here, Next, next. Now, this is disabled. Okay. Now, the pagination component working great. Thank you for your watching. Please subscribe. In this video, we will discuss share state or data between components in Blazor WebAssembly. First, let's create a Blazor WebAssembly project. Blazor WebAssembly app. With the selection next, place a web assembly share state between components. Next, check out this. Create. Now we have created a Blazor web assembly project, namely Blazor web assembly share state between components. 
Before start coding, let's explain what we'll do in this tutorial. First, we will create a test component which includes a built-in input select blazer form control and a display countries in North America. In the second step, create a share state service and register it in the program.cs file of the application. In the third step, inject the share state service in the test component above and the share the current selected country between the components. Namely, we will discuss share application state by using an injected service across the application. Now, let's start it. First, let's create a test component. Namely, in the test component, we are going to display the countries in the North America by using a selected control. In general, components reside inside the pages folder. Therefore, we create this test component inside the pages folder. Okay. First, let's complete the C-sharp code portion. First of all, let's create a country class, which includes country ID and the country name. In the next step, let's create a countries list because there are multiple countries in the North America. Therefore, let's create a country name property. Now, let's create the uninitialized method. Inside uninitialized method, let's create the country list. Let's add each country now. Let me copy this and paste it. Now, we have completed the C-sharp code portion of this test component. Save this. Now, let's create the HTML code portion. Namely, the input select. For this, let's use edit form. Now, let's create the input select. Let's put it country name here. First, let's add an option which displays select the country, namely a message. Now, let's create all other options by using a for each, because we have a country list here. Therefore, we need to use for each.
we have completed the input select control now let's create a label when we select a country that country will be displayed in the label okay there is some error okay let's initialize this with empty string instead of this set okay so therefore now we can use this condition Let's display with the span. Okay. Let's put them one line. Okay. Save this. Let's add a head them. Okay, let's check it. We have router template. Now we have head them. Then we have edit form inside edit form. We have a label named the country, and then we have a built-in Blazor input select inside the select. We have binding value name is this country name because we are going to share the country name across application. Therefore, the bind value assign it this country. Then we have created an empty valued option. Namely, we are going to display an information select a country. Then we created other options inside option. This country name is in the value and in the text. We also has the same country name. Now we have completed the edit form, namely we have completed the input select. After that, when we select a country, the selected country will be displayed in a label. Namely, we have created a label. If the country is not empty, at that time we will display that country in a label. Inside the label, we have selected country and then we are displaying that country name. In the C# code version, we have created a country object. Inside country object, we have two property. One is country ID, another is country name. And then we have added an initialized method. And inside an initialized method, we are creating the country list. This is the country list. It's a list I enumerable, and therefore we are creating all country. Okay, let's save this. Now we have completed the test component. In the next step, let's display this test component in the side navigation bar of this application. We have a side navigation bar here. Therefore, I just copy this and paste it here. Then copy this router template and paste it here. This is the label. Okay, let's save this. We have completed the test component. This is the C# -sharp code portion, and this is the HTML code portion. When we select the country, that country will be displayed here, namely display inside this label. Now let's run and see this application. In the next step, we will create a share state service and then we will implement it inside this component. Namely, we are going to share this country name, selected country name across this application. Okay, first let's run this application. Now the application is running, let's see. The application is running now. Okay, this is the test component label we just created. 
if I click here, hopefully it will be display a drop down list, namely a select control which includes the countries in the North America. Okay, countries in North America. This is the control. Let's see this. We have United States, Canada, Mexico, all countries in the North America. Okay. If we select United States, now we selected United States. If we selected Mexico, if we selected El Salvador, it will be displayed here. Let's put a space here. Okay, just here. Space. Save this. Now select again. Okay, we have space here. Okay, we have completed our test component. This test component is very simple. It has only one select list. Namely, inside the list, we have several countries in the North America. When we select our country, it will be displayed here. In the next step, we will create a share state service. We are going to share this data. Selected country across application. Now, the state of this input select is Dominican Republic. Namely, in the select input, we are selecting Dominican Republic. If I selected Costa Rica and then navigate away this page, visit some other pages, and then come again here, at that time, there is no Costa Rica selected. Instead of selected country, Mr. Z because we didn't implement the share state service yet. If we implement the share state service, as a time, when we select the country and then navigate away this page and come again this page, as a time, the state will be preserved. Now, let's do that. First, let's create a service folder. Now, let's create the interface. Create data. Okay, let's create the event. This unchanged event will be called when the selected country is changed. Save this. Now let's implement this service. Because this is a property, when we set some data, namely when the selected country is changed, we will notify. Therefore, this is a method. Now let's implement this method. Now we have completed our share state service. Save this. In the next step, we need to register this share state service in program files. Here we need to register it. Now we have registered our iShare state service. Save this. In the next step, we will inject this service in the test component and uh, share data across the application. Now let's do that. First, let's inject the service. Okay, we have injected the service. Now we can use this service and share the selected country name across the application or between the components. Now let's do that. Instead of this country name, 
we are going to use this service because inside this service we have data property therefore we can use this first of all copy this we need to add state has changed inside the uninitialized method because we have unchanged event therefore okay we have added this event since we have added this event state changes when this page is destroyed we need to remove this therefore we need a dispose method here copy this just remove this save this when this page initializes it state has changed even namely this unchanged event will be fired then when this page is destroyed that event will be removed okay okay now we can share data across application actually we are going to share this variable namely this country name therefore instead of this we need to use this service therefore just copy this data then instead of this we also use data Okay. instead of this we also use service data now we don't need this therefore I just comment this save this now we are going to share this data namely selected country across the application therefore in order to see that let's show the selected data in the home page we have a home page here let's share that selected country in the home page first we need to inject the service here okay now we can get data Okay, let's check this. Country here, and we have a span element here, and then this data because this data is shared across application. Namely, the share state services data property has been initialized inside the test component when we selected a country. Here, when we selected country, the data property of the share state service we will be initialized therefore when we selected the country we are going to display it in the home page we just display it here save this now the service is completed let's see the result let's refresh this okay when i selected mexico and then navigate away this page and come again as a time the selected country still be mexico because we have created share state service and implemented it inside this test component and the sharing selected data across the application let's check this now i already selected mexico if i go to the home it will be display the country name of mexico okay this is the mexico if i navigate to this test component again it still be selected the mexico because we have implemented the share state service okay let's do that okay it's still displaying mexico let's test again if i select costa rica and then navigate away okay come here if i navigate to home it will be show costa rica okay costa rica then if i navigate to test component again it still show the costa rica okay costa rica now it works great now let's summarize this in this application first create a test component 
Inside the test component, we have created a selector. Inside the selector, we have displayed the countries in the North America. After that, we have created a service, namely a share state service. After that, we have registered iShare state interface and the share state service in the program CS file. After we have registered service, as we know, we can use this service by injecting in any component. We have injected the service inside the test component. Then, because we have data property inside this service, we have assigned the selected country to the data property of this shared state service. Then, we have displayed that selected country in the label here, in the test component. In the meantime, we have displayed the selected country in the index component, namely in the home page. First, we have injected the service, display that selected country here. Namely, we have sharing data between components. In other words, we have shared the selected country between test component and the index component. Thank you for your watching. Please subscribe. In this video, we will discuss file uploading in Blazor WebAssembly app. Before start coding, let's briefly explain what is the file uploading process in Blazor WebAssembly app. In Blazor server apps, file uploading is straightforward. The app is running on the server and we can directly access the file storage to save the uploaded files. However, a Blazor WebAssembly app is running on the client. We can't directly access the file storage on the server. Therefore, we need some additional process to pass the uploaded files from the client to the file storage on the server and save them. We need an app which is running on the server. Namely, we need a web API to upload and save the selected files to the server. In other words, in this tutorial, we will create a simple file uploading application just like this. We have a Blazor WebAssembly app is running on the client. Then we will upload some files. The uploaded files will be passed to the server by using the RESTful API. Then this RESTful API access to the file storage on the server, save the uploaded files. This is the application we are going to create in this tutorial. For this, we will create a Blazor WebAssembly hosted app. Since it includes client, server and shared projectors as shown on the right. Namely, we are going to create web application one solution. Inside the solution, we have three projects. The first one is web application one client. Actually, this is a Blazor WebAssembly app, which will be run on the client. Then the second project is application one server. Actually, this is a RESTful API, which has controllers and methods including get, post, and etc. Finally, we have a project web application one dot share. This is a class library, include modulus, business logic, etc. Now let's start coding. Let's create a new project. Blazor WebAssembly app with the selection next. Blazor WebAssembly file uploading. Next, check out this and check in this ASP.NET Core hosted because we are going to create a Blazor WebAssembly hosted application. With the settings, click create. Okay, the application has been created. Blazor WebAssembly file uploading. This is the solution file. Inside the solution file, we have three projects. The first one is Blazor WebAssembly file uploading.client. The second one is Blazor WebAssembly file uploading.server. The third one is Blazor WebAssembly file uploading.share. As we described previously, this is the Blazor WebAssembly app. This application will be run on the client. Then we have the second one. Second project is actually a web API, ASP.NET Core Web API. Then the third project is 
a class library and uh, this class library will be included classes or models okay now let's start we will start coding from the shared project because inside the shared project is we are going to create models or classes or business logics first we will create a folder namely a models folder then inside the models folder let's create the class uploaded file let's say we have a file and we are going to upload that file at the time we need the file name and of course we need the file content therefore this is the file name of the file to be uploaded and this is the file content to be uploaded in bytes actually this property is a byte array this array will hold the whole byte of the file to be uploaded okay save this as we described it previously this is a blazer web assembly app therefore this application is running on the client when we file upload we need an API pass the uploaded file to the server. Therefore, the second project actually is the RESTful API. Inside RESTful API, we have controller folder. Therefore, first, we need to add a controller. Let's add empty controller. file upload controller okay second step we are going to create a constructor of this controller as we described it previously first we upload some file on the client and then that file will be passed to the server by using the api then we are going to save the uploaded file to the file storage on the server therefore we need the environment of the server namely we are going to inject iWebhost environment because the file storage is on the server therefore we need the pass of the file storage in order to save the uploaded files therefore we need to inject iWebhost environment service now let's inject it In the next step, let's create the post file method, a post method. We are going to pass the uploaded file. Here, we are going to pass the uploaded file object we just created in the shared project. As described earlier, we need the full pass of the file storage on the server. Therefore, we are going to get the web root pass. Then the uploaded file name. Here yeah, now we have uploaded file. Inside the uploaded file, we have two parameters. The first one is file name and the second one is file content. Therefore, in the next step, we are going to create a file stream by using this pass. Then we will copy the file content to the file stream. Let's say file stream. We are going to create a file stream. Okay, now we have created a file stream by using the file storage full pass. Actually, we may do that. Now we need to write the file content to this file stream. Therefore, write 
uploaded file has the file content zfo file content from 0 to lens namely we are going to write the file content from the start to the end then in the stage we are going to create an action result and return it therefore actually this is an information and the uploaded file name that's it in order to keep this application simple here we didn't use try catch only wrote here the necessary codes without any try catch or other error management since this is a post method therefore we need to write some attribute namely http post save this now we have completed the file upload controller finally one thing here because we have used webroot folder therefore we need a webroot folder inside this application in other words inside this api project we need to create a ww root folder therefore actually this is the file storage in the server the uploaded file will be saved inside this web root folder therefore this web root pass will give us this www root this folder name and then we are going to add the file name and the uploaded file will be saved inside this web root folder save this now we have created and completed the web api this is a simple api this api only has one method post file method let's briefly explain this file upload controller inside constructor we have injected i web host environment service because we are going to access the file storage and we are going to save the uploaded file in the server therefore we need some information about the hosting environment then in the second step we have created the post file method this is the argument of this post file method and in this object we have file name and the file content to be uploaded first we get the web root folder we just explained it and then we get the file name and create the full pass of the file to be saved after that by using this pass we have created a file stream after we have created the file stream we just write the uploaded files content namely file content will be written to this file stream actually in this step file upload to the server and the save to the server is completed then finally we have created the result namely we are going to return the location of the uploaded file we have some error here we should put file name then we have created a result by using the web root folder the location of the uploaded file in the server and then the file name has been uploaded actually this result will be written an action result okay now we have completed the file upload controller save this in the next step we are going to create a component in the blazer WebAssembly app and using this file upload controller or using this API we will pass the uploaded file to the server now we have the RESTful API therefore we have the URL of the API we need to keep it somewhere therefore first step in the client side namely in the blazer web assembly project first we will create an app system file It is a JSON file, therefore app settings. Okay. First, let's run this. Because we have just run it.
because inside this controller we have API here. So therefore, we need to put an API here. Okay, that's it. Now we have the app settings JSON file inside the Blazor Web Assembly project. Okay, let's create the component. In general, components reside inside the pages folder. So therefore, file uploading and we just created a file uploading component first file uploading this is the router template second we need to inject some services because we are going to pass the uploaded file to the server by using the API therefore we need HTTP client Then we just created app settings file. Therefore, we need a configuration service. Okay, we have some issue here. Therefore, before inject the I configuration, we need to add a namespace to the imports. Okay, Microsoft extension configuration. Save this. Okay, now we can inject i configuration service we have injected two services the first one is http client the second one is i configuration next we are going to use a system io and we also use the file upload object therefore we need to we need to inject your project Now let's create the controllers which will be needed. Let's use form. Let's say on upload files. Later we will create this method. Now let's create the input file. This is the main control. This control has an unchanged method, unchanged event. Later we will implement this. Sometimes we need to upload multiple files. Next we need to create a button, namely upload button. Now we have completed the main HTML code portion of this component. This is a very simple form, only includes two control. One is input file, the second one is just a button, namely a submit button. When we're going to upload this, we will click it and uh, then this message will be called and the file will be submitted to the server. File will be passed to the server by using the API. This is an input file change. Every time we upload file, this method will fire this event. Then file will be saved temporarily on the clients. Then it will be uploaded by using this button. Okay, let's display some message after file upload is completed. We just copy this. Save this. This is the main control of the file upload in Blazor WebAssembly app. Uh, in this component, we have an unchanged event. Unchanged event 
will be fired every time we are going to upload a file. Therefore, in the C-sharp code portion, we are going to create this on input file change method. Then we have a button, namely the button type is submit and this is the upload files. After we selected the files to be uploaded, at that time we will click this button. When we click this button, this on upload file method will be called and the uploaded file will be passed to the server by using the API. Therefore, in the following section, we will do three things. One, we need to create on input file change method and then we are going to create an upload file method. The third one is we are going to create a variable named a message. Now let's do that. Because this is a Blazor WebAssembly app, the application is running on the client. Therefore, when we upload the file, the uploaded file will be resided inside the iBrowser file service. Therefore, first we need to create a list and inside the list we are going to keep iBrowser file. Now let's create this on input file change message. Just copy this. This message we will accept it input file change event args. By using this event, we can get the uploaded files. Sometimes we need to upload multiple files, therefore e dot get multiple files. Now we have the selected files, namely this is the list of the uploaded file. Then we need to show some message. We have a count property, therefore we can get that. Then when we upload a file, the state should be changed, therefore now we have completed on input file change method. When we upload file, on change event will be fired and that event will be called this on input file change method. This method is accepting and input file change event argues. Inside this argument we have the we have the actual selected files to be uploaded and then inside this selected file we have code and we have other information. Therefore as a message we are uh, displaying the count of the upload selected files here. When we upload a file and the state of this component is changed, therefore the state has changed, message has been called here. In the next step, we are going to pass the uploaded files, namely the selected files, to the API. Therefore, we need to create this message. Copy this. This is the actual method. When we click this button, namely when we click the upload file button, this method will be called. Sometimes we need to upload single file. Sometimes we need to upload multiple files. We have created a list. Actually, this is the selected file list. Inside this list, there are multiple files. Therefore, we need to use for each. Each time loop through, we are going to get one single file. Inside this single file, we have file name and we have file content. Actually, we are going to save this file on the server inside the file storage. Therefore, first of all, we need to create a memory stream. Namely, after upload, we are going to keep the uploaded file in the memory stream and that memory stream will be saved in the server. Therefore, now we have a file, the first file for example, open and read the stream inside this file. Copy that stream 
to the memory stream. Okay. Here we need to add a sync. Okay. Now inside this memory stream, we have the file content. In the next step, we are going to send this file to the server. Therefore, first we need to create upload file object. Because post file controller method will accept this uploaded file object. Therefore, we need to create an uploaded file object. Model. Okay. First, we have file name. File content. We have file content. We just copied the file content to the memory stream. Therefore, ms. This is the file content. Memory stream converted to an array and assigned it to the file content. Okay. Now, we have completed the uploaded file object. Therefore, in the next step, we need to call the API by using the HTTP client. Therefore, in this step, we are going to pass the uploaded file to the server by using the API. Therefore, we need to use HTTP client because we just injected it post JSON async. Okay. So the object is uploaded file then we need the url of the api therefore actually the url inside the json file copy this and because we have configuration we have configuration here because here we have injected the configuration service okay now we have the base URL after base URL in the controller we have API here and then we have controller here this is the controller after this file upload we have post file therefore file upload slash post file therefore this is the base URL this is the controller name and this is the post method name then this is the object to be posted therefore just copy this paste it here okay okay at this point by using http client and using the restful api we just created we have posted, we have sent the uploaded file to the server and save it. Because inside this API, inside this controller method, we are saving it. At this point, the file has been passed to the server and save it to the file storage on the server. Now, let's write a message. After upload is completed, we need to display this message. Then, after we complete the uploading process, the state will be changed. Therefore, we need to do this. Okay, state change. That's it. Now we have completed this file uploading razor component. Save this. In the next step, we are going to call this component in the side navigation bar of this application and then we will run this application. Actually, we have a side navigation bar of this application. This is the side navigation bar. Therefore, I just copy this portion, paste it here. Then inside this file uploading component, we have rotor template just copy the rotor template copy this and paste it here this is the menu now save all now we have completed the application before run this application let's check that once again and this is the 
uploaded file and this is our controller and this is json okay we have an error here just save this note that the uploaded file will be saved inside this folder now this folder is empty let's run this application and see the result okay okay this application is running this is the component we created if i click this file upload menu file upload controllers will be displayed here hopefully okay we have here blazer web assembly file uploader and the selected file we have the browser here and this is the chosen file component and now we have a message no file is selected actually we didn't select any file yet and then we have the upload button after that we have the message this message is same with the message here now let's try this application first click this we are going to select some file here yes, three file i have selected all we just open this and now three file is selected now we need to upload this okay three files uploaded on server hopefully we have uploaded three file let's check that here now we have file okay let's see we just uploaded this okay we just uploaded this the application is working great in this video we have created a simple blazer web assembly file uploading application thank you for your watching please subscribe